Good morning, guys. Welcome out to Revolution. Uh, we're going to continue our study into the Texas Receptus. And so uh, last week we had a bit of an introduction. And so we're going to go through Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And we're just going to start reading through the New Testament. And what I want to do is I want to examine the Texas Receptus editions that we have available to us. I want to look at the English translations, if possible, language translations, I guess, that will depend on who joins our studies. And in a way, um, I'm not afraid to revisit these videos again, in a sense where um, if I go through, um, you know, Beza, if I go through Stephanus and I go through Erasmus, but then later on we find, um, you know, Cess's uh, Greek edition online and we want to, have a look at that. Well, I can always look at that in a, in a later video. Um, but I want to go chronologically through the Bible from Matthew all the way through to Revelation. Now, this will take forever. <laughs> and it's going to be one of those um, open-ended projects that just sort of never finishes. But in the meanwhile, we'll learn a lot about the Texas Receptus. <clears throat> and so the... Um, you know, what What are we going to base this on? Well, we're going to base this on my website. So since 2008, I've been running the webpage textus-receptus.com. And so I'm going to just throw this link into the banner here. And um, this is the, the link. It's quite easy to remember. If you're going to do anything in IT, um, try not to have huge names, or if you do, try to make it in, um, try to make it small, um, like, you know, a, a TR, you know, is very easy to remember. Um, okay. So, whoops, show. So, tr.org.au. <clears throat> so, if you go there, it'll take you to this page. The Texas Receptor. So this is my website. Um, it looks like an old style Wikipedia format, which it is. It's an old style. Uh, if you go down the bottom, it's powered by um, Media Wiki, which I find is very easy to work with. Um, you can immediately edit things. I saw a typo just two minutes ago. I edited it in probably about 15 seconds. And so it's very easy where other people, they've got websites and it's clunky and yeah you have to go into dreamweaver and you have to do a whole bunch of stuff with it and so but if you go to my main site um now some of these links go sort of nowhere but others are there are very important so as you navigate through the site you'll find that like say if i've got something like um languages <clears throat> there might be a bit on that but i, I in all honesty i haven't put anything into languages for years and years so this would have been a project that i worked on you know trying to put in tr editions in there but i just haven't worked on it for many years and so but it's one of those things that um, i should really work on but say books if we go to books um there's heaps in there and so this is where we're going to sort of start going through our studies i've got scans of you know the complutensian polyglot erasmus's editions um, we've got links to pretty much all the TR editions that are going to get us up to, you know, 1611. And so um, lots of different books as well. So down the bottom, we've got, um, you know, some of these books are rare. Some of them are hard to get. A lot of this stuff links to archive, um, you know, Herman Hoskia, um, you know, Scrivener. And then sometimes, too, uh, you'll find other websites that have lists of books like this. So, you know, James Snap's website, um, Confessional Bibliology website, that there's just links to lots of different books and things like that. So this is a great place to go to if you want to start doing a study. And so we are going to go through, and we're going to just start with the printed text. So we're, we're not going to be looking at the manuscripts just yet. Um, we probably will do that. But um, what I want to do, if we go back to my main website, now, if you sort of scroll down the page, I've got, you know, what the Texas Receptus is, 
little bit of info, a bunch of links there. Um, but then I have this in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Now, if you click on Matthew chapter one, so all, all everywhere where it's blue is a hyperlink. If it's red, that means it's a hyperlink, but I haven't done anything there yet. So we might go to a page and, you know, some of the words are red and that just means I haven't put any information. And also if it's blue, that doesn't mean that there's a whole bunch of information. It might just be two or three little things. Sometimes there's a lot and sometimes there's not much. If anyone does want to help with this website and to edit it and put in information, just contact me. I'll give you um, the rights to log in and to do your own edits. And so uh, so we have uh, Doki Doki says, hey, Nick. We've got Chase Dell says, hello. And uh, we've got a Facebook user there and says, um, hi, Nick Sayers. And so thanks for um, jumping in, guys. So we've got a few people watching. So if we go to Matthew 1. All of these are hyperlinked to Strong's numbers. And so even if I just hover over the book, it's, it shows us that it's um, 976. And so I'm just going to click on number one. So that'll take us to the individual verses. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be basing these studies around my website and around the content that I have on my website. Um, now, sometimes I'm probably going to get to... Uh, a verse where I don't have a huge amount of content. Um, there might just be, you know, the basic bare bones. But what I'll do is um, I'll do do the video and we'll, we'll work through those things as we go. Because, I mean, you know, nothing is perfect in this world. If we wait for everything to be perfect, we'll never do anything. And so, um, I but I, re I thought about this quite a bit, about doing this study. And I really want to look at different editions of the Texas Receptus to match up, you know, things that are in agreement and also look at disagreements. Uh, we want to look at the critical text. We want to see where there are variants. Um, we want to look at um, the definition of words, definition terms, um, and also you know, English versions, English translations, you know, what's translated faithfully, um, what isn't, where we can go to get good resource, um, you know, sometimes <clears throat> I might just, you know, go through a certain um, study and that leads me on a certain train of thought that has helped my Bible study for years and years or, um, you know, given me, given me a place where I can get correct answers. So oftentimes the links on my website are designed like that so, so that people can jump on the website and they can, they can do their own studies because... I do find um, when I'm doing uh, studies into the Texas Receptus, you know, say like Revelation 16.5, I did a deep dive into that. And I've had a lot of people contact and say, that's really good information. So glad you did all that and all the rest of it. But um, at the end of the day, sometimes it can be quite exhausting when people say, well, what about this verse? And what about that verse? And I'm like we all should be doing this type of study like um there's there's the old saying you know we're we're you know a jack of all trades but we're a master of one now in australia i i only knew jack of all trades master of none it's almost like a st sarcastic type of twist to that where you know someone can do a whole bunch of stuff but they haven't mastered anything but the original saying was a jack of all trades master of one and so um we should know you know the basics of the Bible, we should know, um, especially if we, we're defending the Texas Receptus or we're doing, um, you know, text, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the claims of text criticism. We should personally become an expert at one thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a very small thing. It can be one verse. Um, it can be, you know, one word. It can... It can just be something small that you start with, but you become an expert on that. And what I find is um, that it's it's rare to get studies that do a deep dive into just one small detail. 
And I think that's what really needs to be done. Um, oftentimes, you just hear sweeping terms, you know, TR editions, they differ from each other, you know, um, you know, the the Bible version issue, Bible translations, those just sort of fall under these banners and, you know, textual criticism, you know, Erasmus did textual criticism, the same as what we're doing today. And it's like just these terms, these umbrella type of terms that um, many times they're not detailed, then they're, they're not put into correct categories. And so many times people can be confused about terminologies um, and also people can be frustrated about where to look for answers. Um, because like say someone, people who are doing um, this, the type of studies that I really want to do, like say Will Kinney, he's done quite a bit on this. And I know a lot of people um, you know, sort of express to me that they don't like Will. Um, I actually really like Will, and since 2010, he's allowed me to put all of his information on my website wherever I want it. So if he's done an article on, you know, the last 12 verses of Mark, and I can copy and paste whatever he's put on his website onto mine. And so he's allowed me to do that. Um, he, I, I probably the only thing I don't really agree with, with Will, with his bibliology is the the numeric side of things, you know, where where you add all the um, all the letters up in you know, Genesis one, and, and it equals the same as Revelation twenty two um, twenty one, and you know these sort of things. But I, I don't really gel on that sort of thing. But apart from that, um, you know, that's a tiny little speck of sand. Um, when you look at the the amount of work that he's done, it's uh, it's huge. And so I recommend when people say to me, where can I go for answers? And I I just say to them, go there. And even Contras, you know, people who say, oh, you know, where would you get that sort of information from? And I just say, look, just read Will Kinney's stuff. Usually he will direct you in in, in the right place. He will put you, there'll, there'll be a huge article with a whole bunch of inf information but if you read through that, that will guide you in the place that you really want to go. That that will cover most of the base points. And oftentimes it it leads you on the journey where it gives you the answers right there and then. And so um, there's also the kjvtoday.net site. So I might actually put some of these up here. Um so brand pluck web actually maybe i should just go go to it here and pluck.webs.com and if you go to kjb articles i mean he has stuff on everything <laughs> you you know people are like oh where can i find information about this and that i mean just <clears throat> yeah, one Peter shifting sa uh, sands of scholarship. I, I I can't remember even looking at that one, but let's have a quick look, just as a random. And so, uh, oftentimes, yeah, look, he's gone through one Peter chapter one verse one, verse eleven, verse twenty one. Like so, there's at least three verses in one Peter where he's talking about you know differences there. Um, <clears throat> some things he does quite a lot of work on. Other things he might just mention. But if you were going to do a study on 1 Peter, you would go through this. And that's the sort of thing that I'll be doing too. And so on my website, I'll just go back to the main page. So I I have a bunch of links down the bottom of the page, some helpful links, and also internal links. So the helpful links, um, we can see, yeah, another King James Bible, believe it. So that's the Brand Plucks website brand plucked website and so um you know texas receptus bibles that's another good one to go to um where you can you know study about the texas receptus look at english editions greek editions um but the best feature this has is the interlinear <clears throat> so you can compare tr editions and you can compare english editions with this 
um, all the way back to you know, the Wessex Gospels of 1175. And it's quite interesting when you read through or you try to read through that. Um, you can match this up with um, you know, Tyndale, Coverdale, and you'll see that we've pretty much had the word of God in English for like you know, a thousand years in, in many, many of these verses. Um, they're identical. And so it might be expressed in a different way, but it's, um, you know, synonymous. And also, you know, the Greek. And so, and then you can do, you know, studies, analysis versus, you know, um, looking at, say, the word vivlos. It's a noun, neuter, usages book, definition, um, Thayer's, a written book, a scroll, uh, Strong's, uh, properly the inner bark of a papyrus plant. So it gives you that type of basic information and uh, it's very helpful. And so um, we'll be using a lot of these sites. And um, if we find any along the way, um, now there's one website that I've, so, I've, I've used as a bit of a secret weapon for quite a few years. Um, but I have shared it with, like, say, people like Peter Gurry, um, Elijah Hickson, you know, when they've sort of cornered me and, and they're like, who, who is, like, a bona fide scholar, you know, a TR, bona fide, you know, King James only, whatever they want to label us as, uh, TR only scholar. And so um, there are quite a few. Uh, now, I'm going to show you two resources that I go to where I've gotten information over the years and this has helped me so much in my studies and um, I'm I'm not going to hold back any secrets from you guys of where I get information and most of the time I do share this sort of stuff but um, like I haven't got a link to here so which I really should do and I really um, need to do and so there's one guy called Gavin McGrath um, Okay, Gavin McGrath books. Now, um, I always have a caveat. <laughs> like, say, with Will, I'm like, okay, I'm not into the numbers thing. And and he's a Calvinist too, so I'm not really – I'm not a Calvinist, but I don't think that should hinder our studies here, um, you know, people are Calvinists or whatever their um, flavour of um, Christianity is, that they should be able to go through these studies and learn. So Gavin McGrath, he um, – He's an Anglican guy, so he grew up a seven-day Adventist. And it looks pretty basic, the type of work that he's doing. Like, you know, you look at his website, it looks dodgy. And that's the thing, half of these guys, are there, like, say, D.A. Waits' website is, is dodgy. But but he knows his stuff. And so here he has in the middle a commentary on the received text. And so, um, yeah, he's done quite a lot of study. Now, what he's done so far, and this is over years and years, he's gone through Matthew from 1 to 9, Matthew 10 to 14, 15 to 17, 18 to 20. So he's gone through all that. And so at the moment, he's on Mark 4 and 5. <clears throat> and so um, these uh, um, ones here, I'll, I'll actually enlarge in that. So I'm giving you the place where if you want to do deep TR study, this is a good place to go to. Um, you know, this isn't a place where you just want to, you know, scroll through and find a little bit of information. I've gone through these pages, learnt a lot of stuff from Gavin, and let's just have a quick look. So he's got the, the preface, and so oftentimes the preface, he will give you a lot of... Um, information let's just open all of these up he'll give you a lot of information about um you know where his sources are what sources he's going to um and so gavin is an australian guy too so i've contacted gavin a few times um we talked about revelation 16 5 and a few other tidbits but um, he oftentimes he talks about the um, the Anglican Church, and so he might have certain you know prayers and things like that. And so, but he talks about the, the Byzantine text diamonds. So he talks, you know, he's going doing a deep dive into the TR, and so he talks about Codex W zero uh, thirty two, Codex 
uh, Freya, Freya Ineus, uh, fifth century, which is Byzantine in Matthew 1 28, Luke, etc., and so Alexandrinus. So he's going through these, and many times he's visited these manuscripts as well. So you're looking at someone who knows their stuff. You know, these are the the, the purple um, co codices that, say, um, Elijah Hickson has looked at. So he's looked at these. Um, and, yeah, like the purple parchment. So he's got a whole bunch of stuff about that. And, you know, so he'll talk about his sources, um, you know, where he's gone to Greens, Hodges and Farstead. And when you go through it, he's he is quite meticulous. He does a lot of um, deep work here. Um, so this is just in his introduction. So in his introduction, he's just showing you where he's going, um, all about the all about the um, manuscript evidence that he's looking at. And he gives it like the type of rating, like a, a Westcott and Hort type rating. Sorry, it would be more like a, a Metzger rating where they have um, A to E readings. And so if it's an E reading, it should, shouldn't be in there. If it's an A reading, it definitely should be in there. And so then you've got the variant in between. So some readings, he's like, okay, that's a B reading for the Texas receptors, but I, I don't think I've ever seen him go on less than that he's usually able to prove that this reading should be in there and he's looking at latin he's looking at greek and he's you know he's not like um the type of scholarship which is like the two stream um scholarship where you have you know people who are just like latin is evil you know the chick track style thing of uh, you know latin is catholic sort of thing it's like no he's he's looking at the greek he's looking at the um he's He's looking at the Latin. He's looking at other uh, language editions. And he also classifies what, like, Erasmus looked at, what Stephanus looked at, what Beza looked at. And so if we go to, well, he has it like a dedication, and it's usually an Anglican sort of thing. But then he goes through, okay, so the title, the Gospel According to Matthew. So then he starts to study, and he looks at the manuscript evidence of why we have... Uh, yeah, even Evangelion uh, Cutter Matthaeon, the, the gospel according to Matthew. So why it has that. And so that's something that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're, we're starting with Matthew. And so we're going to be looking at that type of thing. And so I'm going to be using Gavin's material. And so he, like, he doesn't really talk much about um, just the individual verses that don't really have many variants. And so he went straight to verse six there. So he's looking at the title, Gospel According to Matthew. And then the next verse is where there's the verse, um, the variant, the king, uh, in the second occurrence that's taken out of the critical text. And so then, um, and he talks about, you know, Matthew one seventeen and, why um, there's 14 generations and things like that. And he has some really good information there. And, you know, Matthew um, 7 to 8, so they're the next variants where it talks about Asar instead of Asaf in the critical text. So we'll be using that information there. Um, and so, yeah, obviously it continues on Matthew 10, 3. Um, and then he has like an appendix at the end we can sort of look at everything. He's just done a whole bunch of homework, um, comparing um, TRs, a, ta a table of instances where Scrivener's text does not represent the properly composed received text. And so he is um, being critical of Scrivener. And so I haven't gone through a lot of this material um, and I really want to um, because I'm also, you know, I've been critical of Scrivener's text for, you know, years and years and years, you know, maybe 10 years now, where I've looked at it and I'm comparing that to the um, text of Beza and, you know, making that video series on that. But he's got some different conclusions here, and so we want to go through that as well. So this is one of the places, like I said, where it's... A, if you're interested in TR study, um, you, you can go here, you can download all this for free. Um, and so 
I'm going to keep a few of those pages open. So we're probably going to have like 40 tabs open <laughs> at the end of this. And so, yeah, just go to Gavin, type in GavinMcGrathBooks.com and you can get there and um, that will take you to this page. And it's quite interesting, you know, and it's quite easy to navigate. Now, one thing I want to show you guys, uh, if you, you are doing like a study into this, like just say you're going to Matthew. Now, just say we want to study Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So it, usually if it's in a PDF like this, go Control F. Sometimes these handy little um, ways to navigate around a computer um, can save you so much time. Um, control F. If I was to look for Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, I would actually just type in 1.1 1, 1 like that. Okay, so we've got Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Oh, there's quite a lot. So uh, I'll put Matthew in front of it. And, okay, so there's none there, but looking at the way he words it, it's like Matt 1-1, one, one, maybe with a full stop. There we go. So he talks about um, the book there. Um, let's go through that again. Okay, so it appears quite a few times. Okay, so Matthew one eighteen. So I guess that would include all the other places, but... All the, um, you know, from 10 to 19 as well. But, yeah, so that way we can go through and we can sort of study what he has to say about that. Um, because this guy, he's a learned guy. He knows, it, knows his stuff. And we want to glean as much information as we possibly can from him. So, yeah, so that's one source. Now, there's another source which isn't, like, chronological like that, but that's going to help us with our chronological studies because we'll go through his studies. Um, he is a... If you actually go to Texas Receptors and you look at on Wikipedia, uh, his name, um, Gavin... Oops, no, it doesn't come up. Maybe it's Byzantine. Um, okay, but anyway, he is sort of classified as, um, yeah, you know, like a, a bona fide Byzantine scholar. And so, okay, so um, where are we going from here? We go, um, there's a really good website I recommend you use all the time called Wayback Machine. Type in Wayback Machine into Google. And you can find this little thing up here. So I've already got it in there, lamblion.net. So let's jump on there. Now, lamblion.net was available up until about 2017 or something. And then he just put up a thing on his website like, uh, why am I casting my pearls before swine? <laughs> See us later. You know, it was like, oh, okay. So his website was really helpful um, from when I first started looking into KJV issues around 2002, 2003. Look, he, he wrote a whole bunch of stuff about Easter, which really helped me a lot. And I'm, I still go through his article and learn things. Um, and so, yeah, so it was quite a lot of years. And he did change the format of his site. And so sometimes in the earlier stages, he's got different articles that he deletes. I think he just reads through them and goes, oh, you know, they don't need that information. He deletes them. But apart from, you know, the sort of, I guess, irrationality of, you know, him deleting his site, it, you know, to me, like people who constantly are deleting their Facebook or, you know, they're changing who they are. And, you know, it's like th there's something wrong there, you know, just just be a bit more stable. You've gone to so much effort to do something, just, just leave it. You know, what, what's the big deal? But um, one thing I can't critique uh, Scott Jones for is his scholarship. It is brilliant. He, he is one of the best scholars that I've found on the issue of um, the Texas Receptus, the King James Bible. And so lamblion.net. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? So he'll have a whole bunch of stuff. Like, half, like In all honesty, half the time I don't read through all that stuff on the front page, you know. 
Um, but I do go to his articles. So I'll open that in a new window. And there's also um, like Bible tools. So this is very helpful too because he has things like Bible comparison chart. So this show, this is, you know, early, you know, early internet days, you know, like 2003, 2004, um, you know, I'm looking at these going, okay, that's the new American standard Bible, um, the ESV. So I guess it's after the ESV came out, new world translation. They emit these words. And so it was quite powerful back in the day to go through these and, and see what was omitted in these, you know, matching up with the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And and so, but oftentimes it's in the way that he words things that are really powerful. He has a powerful way of talking. Now, he, he sort of comes from the school where he is sort of assumes that everyone who is a Bible critic is pretty much unsaved. You, ca you can't be saved. You can't have the Holy Spirit and be involved with this horrible, blasphemous sort of work. And, but when you read through his stuff, it's like he, he really does back up a lot, a lot of what he's saying with scripture. Um, like he'll just say things like, if you read through this and you aren't convinced that um, these Bibles are corrupt, then how can I help you? You're, you're from Satan, you know, sort of thing. And it's like, <laughs> um, do I agree with that? Well, I guess, you know, there, there's a part of me that goes, yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. You know, a good tree can't be a bad fruit, you know, sort of thing. And But then, you know, you don't want to upset everyone and just say that they're all unsaved. But it's like this guy makes some really amazing points. But apart from that, so apart from being as bombastic as, say, Dean Bergon or whoever, you know, is bombastic, he has these great articles. So, you know, 1 Timothy 3.16 explained definition of monogenes, um, indictment of, of uh, ignorance, the uh, Jehovah and the Tetragrammaton, Easter or Passover, uh, which is in heaven, John Bergen ex excerpt, the LXX model of reverse engineering. Um, so this is actually a small amount See, that's what I'm saying. Like, if, if you go to an earlier one of this page, there's probably more. See, yeah, the Calvinism in the King James Bible. So this guy's a Calvinist. So that was just taken. Like, I've gone just, you know, one jump, and he's deleted that article. So I sort of find that with his stuff. If you go, you sort of have to go through each year and you find different articles. And sometimes you find articles that he only had up for a little while and deleted and they're gems. And I'm like, man. And so oftentimes people will be like, where'd you get this information from? And it's like, well, actually I got it from this guy, but his website's been taken down. And so you go to Wayback Machine and, and they're sort of rolling their eyes like, you know, but I'll just give you an example. Um, say if I might go to a little bit further in time uh, he has some really good stuff on all well, this patristic um, chart is brilliant too you know, 1 Timothy 3 16 uh, shows you know Ignatius quoting it in the year 100 uh, again Ignatius um, Hippolytus you know he was manifested as God a man was manifested as God in a body um, etc so very good um, site to go to. Now, I'm sure there's better sites out there now, but back in the day, this was just gold. This was absolute gold. And, um, okay, so where are we? Okay, so, yeah, so in his later ones, he doesn't have any links to any articles. It's like, okay, it's just his website. And that's it. And so, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a shame. Um, but maybe we'll go to here. 2018, maybe you had something there. Nope, still the same. So we'll go to, what's that, like 2014 or something? 
yeah here we are so <clears throat> also um bible promises his bible promises page is very good and he also had quotation here we are quotations so a lot of these guys are you know um calvinist guys reform guys but he has some brilliant quotations and he's gone to a lot of work to to grab these so um you know obviously i'm going to be looking for people who are talking about the bible um issue and so you know even martin luther um william tyndale and uh you know, John Bergon, let's just have a quick look at Bergon. So he just has a whole bunch of gems from Bergon, you know, written out like this. So the you know, he's scoured through the books and every now and then he's like, that's gold. He's copied it and pasted it into his website. So he'll have things like um Aleph B D are the three most scandalously corrupt copies extant. Exhibit the most shamefully mutilated texts which are anywhere to be met with have we become by whatever process for their history is wholly unknown. Um, the depositories of the largest amount of fabricated readings, ancient blunders and intentional perversions of truth, which are discovered in any known copies of the word of God. So that's re revised revision, revised page 16. So that's gold. That's a little gem, you know, um, you know, he talks about acts um, 2028, uh, and what Hort did there. And so, you know, very interesting. So you might um, want to get a taste of, you know, what Bergon wrote about. And so there's heaps of authors there. You know, Ian Bounds, he's got some really good material. Ignatius, he's got Edward Hills. And so this is this is a page that I recommend you go to. So you go to Wayback Machine and just type in lamblion.net. Also... If you go to um, if you go to Amazon, you can get this book. And so I'll just try and uh, I that's a different thing. Um, I'll actually just jump onto my Gmail because I want to show you the book that he wrote, which is gold as well. And I highly recommend this. <clears throat> okay, you can pick this up from Amazon for like, you know, three or four bucks. It's, it's very cheap. Um, Okay, Scott Jones. Da, da, da. Okay. So I'm just trying to find this uh, at the moment. Sorry to bore you like this. Uh, PDF. Okay, so I can't find it at the moment on my laptop. Um, usually when I'm doing a debate, I have this one open, so I might have renamed it something. But what I'll do, I'll show you it on my phone. So I have it um, here on my phone. So I'll just enlarge myself there. So it's just got the cover, you know, the Alpha, the Omega, and, whoops, that's misquoting Jesus. Uh, the Magic of Evolutionism and Modern Bibles. The Magic of Evolutionism and Modern Bibles. And so he shows 90 places where Vaticanus and Sinaiticus have disagreements in them, and he talks about them and why people went with certain readings. And so... Maybe what we'll do, we'll go to uh, Amazon. Actually, maybe I'll just type in the magic. All the magic of evolution. Evolutionism. And one Bible. Okay, here we go. 
this is written in 2017. You're $6.42 uh, on Kindle. So there's no other format you can get that in. I'd highly recommend you, do, you invest in this. I should actually write a rating. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Peter Gurry grabbed this when I, I you know, he was like, do you know any bona fide scholars? And I was like, well, actually, yes, yeah, Scott Jones and Gavin McGrath. <laughs> and Scott Jones, back in the 90s, he was the only one who he knew who had actually collated Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, or large portions of that. And so uh, Helg says, um, hi, folks, past midnight here, but that's my best stream watching time. Hey, Helg, nice to see you again. Um, Johnny says, another one I'll have to catch up um, tomorrow or soon. Um, 2007. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, um, But, yeah, I go through his uh, Wayback Machine stuff, and there's lots of really good material. His early stuff is so good. Like, I'll just go, like, I think that's 2003 or something. Yeah, 2003. His articles, and he has a whole like the three-part series on Bruce Metzger and what a what a heretic he is, and so he has articles, but then he has textual criticism, which is great. Um, but yeah, that looks like the small list that he has later on, so it must be in the middle there somewhere where he just added a bunch of articles. Yeah, it's it's so hard to. Um, yeah, especially when I'm live like this. Oh, here we go. Look at this. You know, King James Version Truth versus versus King James Version Cult. So it talks about the difference between the Word of God and, um, you know, the capital W, Jesus being the Word of God, and the Word of God, the, the small W, the Bible. You know, you can get the Bible and if you spill coffee on it, you can burn it, you can throw it in the bin and, it's not going to affect Jesus, but if you get the word of God, you can pull out his beard and you can crucify him. And, and the difference between, you know, people like um, worshipping the word, the words, the Bible and worshipping or worshipping Jesus. And so he makes this distinction and he calls it, you know, um, King James version cultists, but he would be considered King James only, you know, by pretty much everyone. Um Great article here, false citations uh, in the Nestle Aland United Bible Society text. So it talks about six false citations. Um, so six false citations in 1 Timothy 3.16 alone. Okay, so this is um, very interesting material. When you go through this, he talks about how they've scientifically tested some of these manuscripts, some of them have um, testimonies going back for years and years and years, but they still ignore the testimony of you know people saying that it had um, nominous sacral lines and things. So they're only looking at what they have today, and they're like, oh, those lines are faded, so that's what it's always read. Instead of he talks about the um, uh, what was it, the ultra ultraviolet. Uh, technological evidence by Milne and Skeet. Um, so, yeah, ultraviolet technology. So that's, yeah, quite a very interesting article. I could talk about this website all day. This, um, you know, the guru of te the critical text, uh, talking about Metzger, um, you know, and just the, the type of strange things that he believed and what he was involved with and and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it goes through really good quotations of his. So that's a three-part series. Um, if you want to study, I'm going to put this link here because this, <laughs> this is just like bypassing everything. Let's just go straight to there. I'm just going to throw that in the midst. Go there and start data mining. There's lots of good stuff. You'll find something that will help you. So, yeah, an error occurred. Da, da, da. Oh, I think some of you got that link. Um, the definition of monogenase, uh, that's a good one. Um, so what, what I've discovered in Scott Jones's um, book 
is he tends to use the tra the term traditional tech. So I think he's sort of schooled in Bergen um, type schools. So uh, a lot of those guys use the term traditional text. Some people use the term traditional text um, to deal with the Masoretic text. Some people still use it for the text of Receptus. But regardless, he knows his stuff and he he does, you know, talk about those type of things. And so, um, okay. Uh, hey, Nick, have you read um, Secrets of Mount Sinai? So I guess that would be a book about um, Sinaiticus, I guess. Uh, I haven't read that. Um, that would be an interesting topic to go through. Um, we do not see what you're showing on the screen. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I might have been typing away there. Um, not showing you this. There we go. Sometimes I forget what's uh, happening here. I've got so many screens open. I've, I've worked out how to have four screens. And so I bought myself two monitors. And for a long time, I could only just use one. So I just um, I worked out how I can have four. I've got a TV screen in the background. But I actually turned it off. It was just too many. And um, I'm so used to just using two. But, uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Thanks for reminding me. Um, hopefully it wasn't for too long. That I was doing that, but yeah. So here we have, you know, KJV truth, um, false citations, six false citations in one Timothy three sixteen. Yeah, even Easter or Passover. If you read through that, it's pretty much exactly what I believe. And uh, Will Kinney, um, is higher um, criticism scholarly? Um, he asks those sort of questions. Okay, so this is by um, R. D. Wilson to so some other. Some other guys, Robert Dick Wilson, uh, he learnt like, was it 30, 40 different languages, I think. He talks about him here, the scientific investigation into the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, really good material. Um, so I'm just sort of showing you where you can go for information. We want to... We want to make, um, we want to have the edge over the critical text guys. Now, most of the time we already do. I mean, because their argument, their argumentation is so simplistic. Um, it's it's quite amazing, you know, when I'm going through the, um, the textual confidence collective that, you know, how simplistic their arguments are and how strange um, their teachings are. And, but it, it's always good to, you know, have the best argumentation. And so I find, look, here's even a commentary on the King James Translators preface. It's by Scott Jones. Yeah, great material. Um, so I, I will link to this on my website because I, you know, I sometimes forget that there's just so much good material out there. So it's not an exhaustive com commentary, but he just points out a few things that, you know, they're talking, you know, when they say, oh, you know, um, the translators um, are talking about any translation. Any translation is a good one sort of thing. It's like, no, the English ones that came before the King James are the words of God. You know, they, they might have a few places here and there where they're, they're lacking or whatever, but it's still the words of God. We get Tyndale and it's the words of God. And, but, um, you know, that doesn't mean every Bible translation is good. You know, the meanest translation. And, you know, so he talks about these type of things. And so... Um, Anyway, so I've, I've plugged Scott Jones for a bit there. Um, so where are we going to start? We're going to we're going to go to Matthew one one. And so, if you want to follow along, follow along um, on a website or just follow me. I'm going to show this. So this is going to be the basic structure. Now, there's going to be some things that I skip over only because one of the fe features on my website is. If I find uh, the annotations of Beza somewhere and I, I copy and paste that into my page in Latin, that doesn't help anyone. <laughs> you know, if you can't read Latin, it doesn't help, but it's in there. It's in my site. And hopefully one day someone will, who knows Latin can go through and translate that for us. And, and so I've got information there that 
is some of it's um, very relevant. Some of it's just there copied and paste for, you know, just to show that, okay, we've got that there and I've found it and, or, you know, I've gone through and found a picture of something or someone's written an article and I've got a link there, but uh, it mightn't be directly relevant. But I wanted to keep a bit of a structure, a bit of a skeleton for our studies or else we can sort of end up anywhere. And one of the things was too, I was tempted just to go through maybe critical text variants and just, you know, go through and skip through them. But it's like, do we really want to look at everything? Um, because there are some places and um, doing this type of study has shown me that there's some places where critical text guys, TR guys have no idea about differences in the Bible. They do, things are just not talked about. And so we want to look at everything. We want to uh, examine the claims of many people. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to start doing that right now. So um, on my page, this page just goes on forever. But we're going to keep the basic format of looking at um, Beza, looking at the 1900, and also looking at the 2016 edition. That's one that I've worked on. And I also, also want to, you know, check that as I go as well, you know, to make sure that that's faithful. It's like a, a double check. I've, I've proofread that so many times, but we want to double check um, that as well. So we want to define our terms. What is a book? What is the generation? Um, you know, we're looking at quotations from Dean Berg on the revised version. Um, so they have the book of the generation. Um, where do they get the whole concept of the genealogy of Jesus? Why is it changed? What the Jehovah's Witness had, Jehovah's Witness Bible had, the New King James. Uh, we want to look at all the TR, modern TR editions as well. So what we're going to, basically after going through this, we will know all the printed TR editions, you know, up until, I guess, you know, you sort of got to stop somewhere, but, um, you know, up, up until, you know, 1611 is set that satisfies me. But um, we might also go through uh, a few other, you know, Tischendorf and, um, you know, Westcott and Hall. We might look at the Nestle Alland um, and a few other things. And if it is interesting, we'll exhaustively go through that. But if it's just, you know, they've basically got the same reading forever, um, we won't really bother. But um, we'll just see how it goes as we go along. And we also want to look at manuscript evidence and um, you know, English translations, but also foreign language translations. And so let's, yeah, and commentary. So let's just start. So Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Kata Matthaeon 1.1. Uh, 1, 1. So that's just a fancy name. Kata means according to, um, Matthaeon. So notice it's Matt. With a theta, uh, some have like two tails there. Kata Mantheon one one, Vivlos Genesius Yesu Christu, Wio David, Wio Abraham. So that's the reading of the fifteen ninety eight text. So the reason that I've got the fifteen ninety eight text there is because that's the one historically that has been the closest to. The King James, and so, um, you know, you've got a lot of people will say go to Scriveners, and most of the time, Scriveners and Beezers are identical. Most of the time, there's 190 places where Scrivener changed things. Um, I believe that only 10% of those really needed to be changed. Most of the time, when he's changing something, it's actually making something a plural when it's a singular but in the context it's plural anyway it's like you know so if you were doing a translation you wouldn't even doesn't make any difference you know so most of what he uh changed has no difference whatsoever but say so there are differences so i'll just quickly show you those uh not all of them but just one example say in the pricope adulteri in john chapter uh eight and we go to verse six um I'll show you where in Beza it has me pros poiomenos, me pros poiomenos. 
And so that means as though he heard them not. So I've got an asterisk there. I've got not in Bees' main body of text. He talks about it in his annotations. Um, but so basically the text of Scrivener would read up to there. The text of Bees would read to there. So that would be one of the 20 places where it's translatable. Um, so that's in the middle of the Pricopay Adulteri. Now, in the uh, King James, it has as though he heard them not in italics uh, because it doesn't appear in Beza, um, where, uh, and I've basically just followed the King James italics with the 2016 edition. Now, there's a few places where I, I have amended the italics, like say in. Um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, where it has, uh, he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I'm pretty sure it says that. And so that was all in italics. Um, but now the Trinitarian Bible Society have come out with editions where that's not in italics. So it's like, um, because there's so much Greek evidence for that. And sometimes Blaney um, would put these in. So that's not in, in um, Beza. But the thing is, that's sort of showing you it's a bit almost like having a modern day footnote sometimes with the italics. The italics had many different purposes. And so um, I actually went, when I first did my edition, I went through and I, I only used the italics of 1611. But then I realized when they're yelling out, Hosanna, Hosanna, it's in italics for emphasis. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, um, these, these italics are sort of, you know, sometimes it's to do with that, that, that word's not in there. Other times it's for emphasis. I was like, which is which, you know? And then so I thought, well, I'll just go with the 1900 Pure Cambridge Edition italics. And then later on, as I go through and study these things, it's like, okay, well, um, like say in John chapter 1, John uh, chapter 3, verse 16, we see that it talks about um, the love of God. Uh, and it's in italics in the King James, but it shouldn't be because Beza actually has it. So I haven't got anything really hyperlinked there, but I hereby proceed with the love of God. So that should be in italics. So this is obviously a page I haven't worked on. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. So I've got an article. Hereby proceed with the love of God. So in the original um, uh, 1611, it has love of God. It's not in italics. And... I've shown by underlining here, it's Tothio, which is, um, this is the 1598 of um, Beza in his Greek, Latin, and Vulgate. So in his Latin translation, it has uh, Charitatum Dei, which means the love of God. Um, so I guess I've underlined Charitatum there, which uh, is uh, Agapeo there. And Charitatum Day appears also in the Vulgate. So you can clearly see it's in the Greek. So why that ended up in italics. But see, then the New King James comes along and departs from the whole thing. Um, he, this, by this, we know love. It doesn't say of God. So many times I actually just cut out italic, italicized words. And so um, the love of God so I actually should just have of God there underlined. I've got love of God. That's where I'm getting confused. But, um, yeah, clearly, you know, it's in Scrivener's text as well. So they say, oh, we're following Scrivener's text. They're departing from the TR here. This is, so, so people say, oh, the, the New King James that follows the text of Receptus. So, okay, just point to, it's an easy one to remember because, you know, John 3.16, just go 1 John 3.16 is where they depart from the te Texas Receptus. It's very clear. So, um, and, you know, someone pointed out to me the other day and said, oh, well, that's fine. The King James guys, they created their own Greek text. And it's like, yeah, but these guys are, are naming their edition after the King James, saying that we're following the same Greek text and we're, we're also following the same English text. And so it's like, but they're not. They ignored the English. They've ignored the Greek and they've, they've followed I, italics which uh, I'm pretty sure Blaney in his 1769, that was the first time it was italicized, or it might be, there might've been something a bit earlier than that. But um, you know, why do that? Why, why um, you know, he might've seen some manuscript somewhere that didn't have it, but 
as far as I can see, it's um, okay. So it's talked about. Um, maybe it's absent from the Complutensian edition. Um, so yeah, he talks about it in his annotation. So Bees has got something to say about that. Anyway, so that's just another example. So let's get back to Matthew. So I was just showing you, you know, why um, why I've got Beza there. So uh, over Scribner, I could easily have Scribner, and I do down the bottom of the page here. If you go to the Greek here, I've got Scribner's text, and here, eighteen eighty one, um, Biblos Genesios Jesu Christu, we are David, we are Abraham, FHA Scribner, the New Testament in the original Greek according to the text followed in the authorised version, Cambridge University Press. So that's exactly what you'll find um, here. And so, um, and that's exactly what you will find with Beza anyway. So what you're looking at is Scrivener's text and Beza's text will match up 99.9999% of the time. And so you, you're sort of splitting hairs when, when you're talking about the, the divisions between those. But as we just saw a division, um, between the New King James and the King James. And so there are actually differences between uh, Scribner and uh, Beza, like we saw in the Pricobay Adultery story with um, where it says, as though we heard them not. So that's not in Beza, but it is in his marginal notes. He talks quite a bit about that. And he, he talks about how he finds that type of story um, uh, sort of like unbelievable uh, that he wrote on the ground. He was sort of writing another message and there is an apocryphal story about what he wrote on the ground. And so maybe Beza was sort of like overreacting to that and saying maybe this is from an apocryphal reading. And, and so, but anyway, we're going to continue on because it's not so much the text of Beza, even though Beza's is 99.9999% of the King James. It's not so much the text of Scrivener. We believe it's the underlying Greek text of the King James. And so in these studies, what I want to do also is I want to create that text. And so we're going to be going through and looking at Beza, looking at Scrivener. Where they're in total agreement, we're going to keep that reading. Where there are disagreements, we're going to examine those issues we're going to make a decision of what backs up the King James the best. And we're going to basically create that Texas Receptus. So then I don't have to hold that up and say, oh, this doesn't have the final amen at the end of Ephesians, you know, or this, you know, has this other reading and they made it plural where it should be singular. And, you know, just the tiny little things in that. We're going to clean that up as we go along. And um, I'm going to put it on my website as you know, the, the Texas Receptus, the underlying text that the King James guys never got around to printing, um, that Beezus is very, very close to, that Scrivener did a really good attempt at, um, at, but there's just a few tiny little places that we want to clean up. And so we want to do that as we go along. So what does it say in the 1900s? So why do I use the pure Cambridge edition? Um, pure Cambridge edition, it seems to be, the one that most serious King James Version um, scholars look to. So this has um, some of the issues cleaned up in it, uh, in King, King James editions. And so um, here we have yeah, the Pure Cambridge edition. So one I always usually talk about is further, not farther. Okay, so it has further, not farther in or bereath or betrayeth, you know, so there's, most of this has to do with spirit, um, the capitalization of spirit. Um, but it, most of the time when you talk to people about this, pure Cambridge edition, out of all the King James uh, editions, that's the one that has um, the issues tidied up. And so... Okay. Okay. So, um, the nineteen hundred says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if we go to Matthew one one, 
because I want to read through these in the King James original. We want to see if there's any difference. And um, as we go along, we'll see, you know, are the are the italics, you know, the way that they should be, uh, you know, because sometimes you find, like I say, even in Matthew, in my studies, I've found that, say, the Blaney edition has more italics in it that are completely unnecessary. So here it has in verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away to Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now, if you were to go to any website, um, and I'll go Matthew 1, AJV, Bible Gateway. Let's go to verse 17. Okay, well, maybe they don't show italics on that website, so. Dun, dun, dun. Maybe Blue Letter Bible. Okay, so here we see the usually this is a normal print um, format. So I'm just going to look in my um, King James here. This is a um, Thompson Chain Reference Bible. So Matthew chapter 1. Verse 17 and the, the three R's that I mentioned are in italics. So I just want to point that out because that first page we looked at didn't have those italics. So these italics didn't appear in 1611. So this is one of the things where it's like, um, I know that Blaney has put these in or perhaps even before Blaney, it would be good to find out where you know these italics started coming in like they do. But oftentimes people read these italics as if, you can sort of chop them out. You can get rid of them. You don't really need them. And so I've actually, I remember talking to one guy and he said when he reads through the Bible and he sees an italic, he doesn't read it. And then I was thinking, yeah, but in the original, th those italics aren't there a lot of the time. Sometimes, like say the word, the word here that appears three, three times, ah, that's necessary for just normal English comprehension. So all the generations from Abraham to David, if you leave that out and just say 14 generations, well, it's, obviously they are 14 generations. And so um, it mightn't actually have the word are in there, but they are 14 generations. You can't have a... Um, you can't have an English um, sentence that um, doesn't have that word are in it. it 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 just won't make sense and so it'll be like the you know literal bible sort of thing <clears throat> but we're looking at um matthew one here so the book and so the book is spelt different with an e on the end uh, that is in capitals and here we have a nice little picture of neptune which is pretty interesting uh the book of the generation of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham and so um, differences in that uh, Jesus, uh, the J's are exactly the same as the I's. You'll notice that. So it's actually Jesus, Jesus. Um, but was it pronounced Jesus? I'm not sure. In 1611, that would be a whole interesting um, topic. Where you look here, it's um, Jacob is Jacob, um, Yekonias, and so perhaps it was closer to you know the actual Hebrew pronunciation of having like Yehovah instead of Jehovah, you know, the, the J sound seems to have been something that um, has come into English, but perhaps um, it, perhaps it was vocalized. Perhaps it wasn't. Um, that would be an interesting topic to look into. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to just check and see we're looking at the same thing there. And, um, what I'll do is most of this stuff that we're looking at, I've got pictures of down the bottom of my page. So there we have, I'll open it up in a new window. So then we can just compare it. And voila. 
Okay, so the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, comma, the son, S-O-N-N-E, the old style spelling of David. Um, and notice that the V's are used, the U's of E's many times in, in these old style Bibles. Uh, the son, S-O-N-N-E, of um, Abraham. So it reads exactly the same. Um, the 2016, the only difference is uh, son of David, son of Abraham. Now, oftentimes in the old King James, I guess you'd call it, you know, the King, the original King James, um, it has the son. And so sometimes titles, they're not uh, made clear um, with capitalization. The King James Version doesn't do capitalization. And so um, the 1611 that I've worked on, I've uh, put capitalization in there because uh, oftentimes it will have, you know, has Hosanna to the son of David and the son of David's in capital letters. And so um, I do go through that and explain those type of things. And But I'm open to uh, anything. So Chase McDowell, um, a Roman god, what in the world? <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite interesting. And But that actually was in the Bishop's Bible. What, what's quite amazing is even with Erasmus's edition, if you look at like Matthew 1, it's got like a picture of an angel with his butt sort of poking out and it's like it's it's a weird picture and it just it just seems like in those days um that type of thing was just normal for printers to use you know <laughs> and so um and i've sort of heard people saying you know other oh, the translators would never have approved of of that but when we go down to um i'll just go down to the english translations again when we go down to this one here, that looks familiar, doesn't it? That's the Bishop's Bible. It's exactly the same picture. So it's quite amazing. Um, so that's the King James picture. So you've got Poseidon with the trident. Um, so, yeah, it, it's quite amazing. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that as well. Um, excuse me. Tissue is better than that's better. Um, yeah, so that's quite interesting. The bishop has exactly the same picture. So, of course, all throughout that generation, they could have said, Hey, the, and this is the bishop's Bible, you know what I mean? This is like the, the holy book and all the rest of it, and it's like it's got the picture of Neptune in it. But I think it's, you know, there's got to be, you know, some reason why they have that type of thing. And I think it was just that they didn't really care about those sort of things in those days. I guess we read a lot into things nowadays and, you know, the secret societies and even like the King James genealogical list um, has this type of handshake. I'll just show you. So down the bottom here, we have this type of handshake and it's people have said, oh, that's a Freemason handshake. <laughs> you know, the, the thumb over the hand sort of thing. And it's like, see, it's Freemason. The whole Bible's Freemason. Now, this um, material actually comes from, I'm just going to blow my nose. Just wait a minute. Sorry about that. Something we can't stop on uh, live um, YouTube. Facebook, wherever you are. But this type of prefatory material, um, someone had like the rights to put these in. And so they just used their material. And so obviously the printers, they're, they're going through the Bishop's Bible and saying, well, that's good enough for the bishops. It's good enough for ours. And But yeah, quite an interesting thing to look at. Um, okay, so... Why did I make the 2016 edition? I made the 2016 edition because in many places that I travel to, I've been to Papua New Guinea 13 times. 
I'll street preach there in English and people will understand what I'm saying. I, I preach simple and I preach very clear. But um, when I'm reading the Bible, if I read, you know, King James, if I say, whosoever believeth in him, that they're sort of looking at me sideways. But if I say, whoever believes in him, which is the same, you know, um, <clears throat> shall not perish or will not perish, but have everlasting life, they, they understand that and they comprehend that better. And so that was one of the reasons why I did that. Another reason is I'm interested in translating the Bible into all languages. And one of the things that I found was um, a hindrance when we're going through the Khmer Bible was they were constantly asking what the King James meant. And so I was saying, just go through the King James and you know put it into Khmer. Now, there was a previous... Um, Khmer edition that was based on the Texas Receptus. And so we had that as a guide as well. So all that work had already been done. So we were just sort of matching it up with the King James. Um, but I found many times they would go through and say, you know, what's they had to constantly look up these archaic terms. And so I was like, well, just, you know, here, here's that verse without the term, the archaic terms in it. And so I just found I was constantly doing that. And in the process, just sort of made made this uh, edition. So, if you want to know more about that, I'll, I'm open and uh, you know answer any questions you have about that or criticisms. Um, so, but let's just go down the page. And so, we want to define our terms. Okay, so here I've conveniently put the 1611, the 1900, and the 2016 side by side, so we can examine all these. The book of the generation. Of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So they're pretty much saying exactly the same thing, except for a bit of spelling here and there. And I've got a capitalization of son twice because of the concept of the son of David and the son of Abraham um, being titles. So here we have the Strong's numbers, um, and there we can click on them and look at what they say now the pronunciation is in modern greek the reason i've done it in modern greek is because um i just find that doing it in erasmarian greek people come to a brick wall if you want to learn um that type of language and you want to actually say it you want to listen to audio bibles in that language it's very difficult to Listen to Biblos, Genesius, Yesu, Christu, we o David, we o Abraham. You know, it's like it, all it, to me, it just sounds like um, a phonetic reading of the Greek with an American accent. That's all the Erasmian pronunciation is to me. Like, um, so follow in truth, LJ. Um, one of the ways that you can, um, you can catch up is go back to the beginning and just start just watch it on like 1.5 speed you can you can listen to me at 1.5 speed and it won't be too fast or even 1.25 and when it catches up to the live stream then um yeah then it just goes back to normal speed and so i find that you know if if I've missed a debate and I'm, you know, they're halfway through, I just start from the beginning. I go 1.5, sometimes two speed. I'm just going over all the prefatory material and it's like, and then eventually I catch up to it. So, yeah, here we have the pronunciation of Biblos is Vivlos. And so I recommend that people, if you want to um, move in the school of um, textual if you want to come against text critics, you have to know the, the original languages. You have to know um, Greek. You have to know Hebrew. You have to know English well as, as, as well because oftentimes their arguments will be strong in Greek or something like that, but poor in English. You know, they will say, oh, this Greek word means this and that. And it's like, okay, that's correct. But yeah, when you translate it into English, it means this. And it's like, oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and so oftentimes they'll, you have to know what they're talking about. So we should be learning Greek. We should be learning Hebrew and English. Uh, and when I say learning English, what I'm talking about there is, um, you know, understanding etymology, understanding where words come from, 
where you know where words fit in a, in a sentence um you know, grammatical errors you know people oftentimes they have very simplistic um understanding a very simplistic understanding of the english language and you know say like two negatives um make a positive well that can work in a mathematical equation but that doesn't always work in english and you can clearly say something that's intelligible and say i ain't going to no disco and you, you've said two negatives um or well, maybe that's not a good example but um, I think you know what I'm saying, where some of these grammatical rules, they they fit in certain type of literature, but in other literature, they don't fit. And so it's good to know um, the English language. It's good to know where um, people are creating um, etymological fallacies as well, where they're relating words back to its original meaning. Like, you know, we've done this with the word Easter, going back to bead and, you know, this pagan goddess thing. It's like, oh, that means it's all pagan and, you know, this whole type of thing. And so uh, it's good to study etymology. It's good to study um, English and know English. And so where would I go to, to um, have a good grasp of English? Well, on my, I've got Spotify on my phone. And so there's a really good uh, podcast that I listen to called The History of the English um, Podcast. So I'll just quickly go there. Okay. So I'll just show you guys. Now... So it's the, whoops, it's pretty hard to see that on my phone. Maybe I'll make it nice and bright. There we go. Too bright? <laughs> it's too bright. So the History of English podcast, um, and I'm up to El Elizabethan voices. So it goes through from the first ever, you know, proto- Indo-European language um, group. It goes through from that to the Germanic to your know, Anglo-Saxon, Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, and then through to English and and why you know the French um, influence on English and and it's a very good podcast to listen to. So that that would be one that I would listen to to understand the English language. Um, and many times too, what I find is when you know something fluently you don't tend to want to know the details of it now when i first started playing guitar um i used tablature so tablature is just a number on the string that shows you where to put your finger so it's very simple but it's not reading music and i always regret not reading music because um that shows you the science behind music and so oftentimes I would, I could play by ear, I could play by looking at tablature, but if I looked at a music score, I couldn't read it. And I never really felt the urge to, to read it, which um, I should have done that from the start. And it's a bit like with the English language, many times we speak it, but we don't understand why we do things the way we do. We don't understand you know, the grammatical rules. We don't, um, we don't know a lot of stuff. So Oftentimes you'll find foreigners know more about our language than we do ourselves because they had to learn it. And so, um, good book, um, Encyclopedia of the English Language. Now, I'm pretty sure if you go to PDF Drive, you can get that in PDF format for free. So, you know, they're going through a whole bunch of stuff. Um, syntax. Germanic roots, um, French loan words, all sorts of things. And so it's it's interesting to find out where words come from. And so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that with um, the English there. But with the Greek, obviously it's a foreign language. Um, I would encourage you, if you haven't already learned the alphabet, learn that first. Just learn the alphabet. Learn it in modern pronunciation. Just jump on YouTube. Um, 
and also what i would do if i was beginning greek again and i was talking to my younger self i would go to well, i'll go to youtube um and texas receptors Matthew 1. Oops. Okay, anyway. So this, Vivlos Genesios, if you listen through this, you'll get pronunciation. This is a great video. Um, because you can just go through and read along with it. And he, he's a native um, Greek-speaking guy. And this is the Texas Receptus as well. I'm pretty sure this is Scrivener's text, actually. Um, so, yeah, very helpful to look at that. He start, he's gone through the whole entire Bible. So this is Matthew uh, 1 to 11, which goes for like 54 minutes. So, you, I mean, you can read through 11 chapters and follow along with this. I usually follow along with this until I get tired. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'll try and keep the mouse along with where it's going. And so going through... There's a thing called shadowing. So if you want to learn a different language, um, I highly recommend you go to... Um, this guy. He's on YouTube. Alexander Ugulez. And so I guess that's how you would pronounce his name. So I'll just quickly type that in here. So I'm subscribed to him. And he brings, like, he's brought out videos like six days ago, 13 days ago. Uh, he's got some ver some older ones, but uh, uh, his older ones are actually brilliant as well. So, um, and he just has, you know, how to learn a language fast, overcoming the greatest obstacle in teaching. And he has a thing called shadowing, where what he recommends people to do is to um when you hear what what he does is he puts on headphones and he listens to the language being spoken and he speaks it out immediately even though he doesn't understand what's being said and so um it, it'll say you know vivlos genesios and he's straight away like vivlos genesios he's and he says it loud and he when he's walking so he sort of power walks around his backyard and does this he might look like a psycho, but the guy knows 60 languages, <laughs> 60. Um, and he, he's just brilliant. He, he's he's a full, one of the world's greatest polyglots. So, you know, why not go to the top and go straight to someone who knows a lot about languages? Um, so he has a lot of things, you know, Dutch, Afrikaans, Frisian, Icelandic. He's learned lots of languages. <laughs> and so... Uh, and this is his shadowing. So he has the whole shadowing thing. So, so wouldn't it be great to have a whole bunch of TR people who are learning languages like this? Now, um, you know, Stephen Anderson actually has quite a a, a good... 30 um, part series on the Greek language. And so I'll just, what's that under? Learn. I think he's been banned from YouTube ages ago. Um, but there is one, here we go. So this, it yeah, learn Greek for beginners. So I, this isn't the first video of it. So you'd have to search around a bit and and just find, you know, the first video. Yeah, here we are, learn Greek. So just let me...
put this out there. I don't agree with Stephen Anderson, <laughs> um, but just as much as I would use, if I recommended, okay, here's Dan Wallace's Greek, you know, he's he's off the wall too, you know. So what, with Stephen Anderson, yes, I believe, yeah, his bibliology is pretty much, yeah, Trinitarian Bible Society sort of thing. And, um, but at the end of the day, um, I, I'm not promoting him. I'm just saying if you want to know the Greek language, I would recommend you go through these videos. You you um, um, stop on and one of, one of the things is to don't just you know listen to a video and go okay well that's it. Go through it. If there's things you don't understand, look them up. This is one of the key things about study. This is one of the key things about learning anything. You have to know what you are learning. Now before I become a Christian. I got involved in a cult. So it was called the Church of Scientology. Now, I had no idea about this group. Um, I just heard on the radio one day, they just said, are you looking for purpose in life? You know, we can show you what life's really about and all this. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. You know, my life's falling to pieces and I need help, you know. And so um, they said, you know, write. Uh, so I could quickly wrote this thing down. It was getting the book of Dianetics. So I got this in the mail. You know, this could have been any group. This could have been the Bible. This could have been anything. I, I got the book of Dianetics. I read through the whole thing. And went, okay, I can understand that. And then at the back, it had, you know, if you want more information, ring this number. So I rang the number. It was a church of Scientology. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a church, you know. <laughs> and um, I'm like, okay, that's fine. I can go there. So I went there and um, I was there for maybe about two months. So it, it was weird, but this is before it gets really weird. If you watch the movie Cleared, um, it, it just blows your mind of how weird that cult is. But at the beginning, it's just very basic. They just teach you basic morals of right and wrong and all this sort of stuff. And you're like, wow, this is good. And, and so I was top of the class because I'd already re read the book of Dianetics. And one of the things, you know, everything was pretty much just stock standard basic principles of the world up until that point. They haven't, they hadn't yet gone on about how we were um, thetans standing on the volcano 18 billion years ago when it exploded. That's how weird it gets with the um, B-52 bombers flying above us. <laughs> that is like, you know, crackhead stuff. L. Ron Hubbard was like taking acid and writing this stuff. And that's that's no lie. He was on acid writing this this material. But at, at the beginning, it's like every cult they get you in with a, you know, just nice. You know, you want to get your life together, and you want to give up smoking cigarettes, and you want to stop alcohol, and you want to, you know, live a nice life. And so, one of the things that stuck with me is they make you sit with there with an e meter in your hand. So what an e meter is is basically a lie detector, and they ask you questions and you give answers. And if you tell a lie, show, the meter goes like this. And so what they would get you to do is read through some material on a, on a page. So you read through and they, they would say, did you understand that? And when I, the first time I did this, I actually thought that I understood it all. And I said, yes. And the, the meter went like this. And they said, no, you didn't. And I was like, okay. And they said, read through it again. So I read through it. And when I read over that word that I didn't understand, it went, they said, that's the word that you're not understanding. And I was like, this is insane. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing technology. And maybe it was, a, maybe that was sort of scamming even back then. But what it put into my mind was every word is important. You've got to understand every word. So they said, look, go and read that word uh, in a dictionary, find out exactly what it means. And then come back and we'll do the thing again. And so it was the word emanated. So it's a bit like the smell emanated from the kitchen. Um, and so it had something uh, written and it had it emanated. And so they well, they made me look up the word. I came back, sat on the e-meter. I read through it and it didn't move. It, 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 the lie detector was saying I was telling the truth. <laughs> so I became a Christian maybe about three months later, two months later or something like that after that experience. And so one minute I'm reading all this trash books and I was reading Hindu books and all sorts of things. The next minute I'm, I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, I have to study each word. You have to, you have to know each word because, and they also went through and said, 
you know, if you don't understand that one word, you don't understand the whole concept. And so when I went through that um, story, the my, by me not understanding that one word, it did the this, this sentence didn't make any sense, the whole thing. So by looking up that one word, it gave me um, the ability to understand and comprehend uh, that whole sentence, the whole entire sentence. And so um, this, you know, there was a concept I brought into Christianity. I have to look up every word. And so when I first got saved, I had this. I bought it for 10 bucks. Webster's, it's not the original one, but it had a brilliant thing in the back, a thesaurus, that is really quite huge. And so um, of just synonyms. It's just got tons and tons and tons of synonyms. So what I would do, I'd be reading through in the Bible and it would have, you know, a word like sign, indicate, signal, signify, countersign, endorse, subscribe, an emblem, an index, an indication. And so I would go through all these and then I would look it up in the dictionary. And they also had in the back um, what, like the story of where words came from. Um you know, what it came from where does the word italic come from um the word pertains to italy especially ancient italy and so it would go through italian typeface um so this is actually um aldus minutius that's erasmus's friend so he had that italic type so it was a, it, italy, italy from italy and so um quite interesting all that sort of stuff and so i would go through and read the Bible and, and try and understand every word. And so I've sort of done that since day dot in my studies. And um, that's helped me a lot. And um, we want to do that with every word, but we want to do that with um, also with the Greek, also with the Hebrew. And the thing is, there are false definitions and how we can spot false definitions. So anyway, back to this um, set of videos. So this is like Stephen Anderson. He goes through... Um, the alphabet, he goes through um, learning Greek. And so if you could just sort of reface this and put some other dude on there, <laughs> you know, just just chop his face off and put a Chinese guy out there or whatever, um, there is good information here. And so um, let's just jump in the middle of one of the videos. Start with a TH, the, thou, thine, thy. Those are all singular. And all the ones that start with a Y, ye, you, your, your, those are all going to be plural which is great because you don't lose the meaning that way. Because a lot of verses, it makes a difference whether the U is singular or plural. Greek makes that distinction. The King James Bible makes that distinction. The way that we talk today, we've lost that distinction. A lot of people complain about the King James Version because of the these and the thous, but honestly, they do affect the meaning. And so it's... So you can see the sort of level of scholarship that he's talking about. Um Okay, so I'll just go through some of these comments. Might go back later. Don't see the screen. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I keep doing this. It's really bad. <laughs> oh, my God. Yep. Okay, so here we go. It's great that we have the these and the thous in our language. Um, I think what I'll do, I won't, I will restrict myself from zooming my head in. Because when I do that, I just forget that I've done that. And and I'm looking at things and I'm showing things and you can't see it. So, um, okay. So, yeah, basically, um, Stephen Anderson's material in the King James Bible. So this right here, second person singular would be thou, and second person plural would be ye. So this is you singular, you plural. This word is pronounced echis, and this is pronounced echete. All right, so echete and echis are the second person, you singular and plural. Then we have third person. Third person is when we're talking about someone else. So this would be... So you can see the level of scholarship there as well. So... Um, I was in a cult too. I am XSDA. That's interesting because um, uh, Gavin McGrath, who I was pointing out earlier, 
this guy, he was an SDA guy in Australia and uh, he came out of that and he's become an Anglican, but he's the one who's written the, um, the textual commentary on the King on the Texas receptors, basically. Okay. So, um, yeah. So where do we learn our Greek from? Um, because we're learning modern Greek, um, I would go to uh, YouTube and I would just simply just type in, you know, um, you know, Greek alphabet. Off. And so, yeah, these type of uh, videos, I've gone through most of these videos and they're very helpful. And yeah, here you go, Greek alphabet. This, this is um, Anderson again. So he teaches it. And yeah, and when you learn the modern pronunciation, then you have access to all these videos. If you only uh, learn the er er Erasmian pronunciation, um, yeah, so uh, Chase is saying, is is he using the modern? Yes, he is. And so he also does a video. Um, is it going back to the Greek? Where he has... Um, so this has got um, like Taylor DeSoto in it and Dane Johansson. And so... So there's Dane there. Um, Taylor DeSoto is in this as well. So they basically go to um, Greece. I think it's Crete or Cyprus, I think it is. And, and they um, – oh, just Dane. Okay, sorry. Uh, I thought he, uh, he was with them. So, But, yeah, that's it's interesting. So the, these guys are just using modern Greek and they use the text of Receptus and preach to people in that and ask them, you know, can you understand what we're saying? And they're like, yeah, we can. And so it's it's a very good argument for why we should just use modern pronunciation. And um, rather than me talk all about that, I would recommend you just, you know, this is one of the areas where you go, okay, Stephen Anderson to me is like, um, it's like if you knew that there was, there's a house burning down, but there's a bunch of jewellery in the top drawer on the second floor. You run in there, get the jewellery, and run out. <laughs> Don't hang around Anderson stuff. Um, he Next thing you know, he, he will have you thinking that homosexuals should shoot themselves. Um, he, he, you should you know, pray that Obama dies. The Bible says we're not to judge the world. Um, so he doesn't have any distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, we shouldn't pray that Obama dies. We should pray that we have an opportunity that he becomes a Christian. You know what I mean? And and so um, it's just strange. He, he just has a strange theology. So anyway, uh, that's enough of um, Stephen Anderson. But, yeah, if you want to learn Greek, if you want to know about the Greek language, I would go through his stuff. Now, there is also another really good resource, which is oh, um, oh, I've forgotten it. Oh, I've got them on my website, so I'll just quickly go there. tr.org.au. Uh, and if I go to my page, Nick. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay. I won't be one sec, guys. Language transfer. That's the one. So this might take you to SoundCloud. I'm pretty sure it's all on YouTube anyway. Uh, okay, so language transfer, Spanish, Arabic, Turkish, German, complete Greek. And so you can see down here there's... Yeah, 20 tracks there. I think there's like, there's hundreds. It get, gets up to like you know, 150 tracks. And so very helpful. I'll just play one. So we saw some strange closed versions of the verbs now where the verb changes completely in its closed form. 
So, for example, we had I C, which is Lepo, Lepo, and then the closed version is Do, Do. Very different. How would you say? So that? it's it's very good to go through these and listen to them. And um, so that's on SoundCloud, um, and here it's on free for free on the internet, free courses. So you can also do other languages. But um, yeah, so that's a very good one to learn Greek. Um, Helgi said, um, going back to the Greek is an excellent uh, documentary. It shows how close New Testament Greek is to modern uh, to modern Greek. Anderson's uh, theology on certain parts, however, is a huge problem, but he's very good on Greek in the King James Version. Yeah, and so that's what I would say as well. It's like, okay, well, um, unfortunately, he's got his issues, but um, the, the amazing thing is, like, we would, like, say someone like uh if tommy wasserman brought out a course uh, you know read greek or whatever and it was just like the same sort of stuff anderson's teaching well he doesn't believe in literal hell he's, he's a worse he's got worse theology than anderson you know what i mean and so it's like oftentimes we we've become so conditioned that people in the academy can be liberals and but you can still use their material and you know look about them and all this but it's like Okay, on the other side, you've got people who are labeled King James only to, you know, whatever they're labeled as. And, you know, sometimes they've got, you know, this one thing that it's like, well, that's, that's actually a good thing. Maybe we should all learn that. Um, but because they are, they, they've got some weird ideas and we don't want to be associated or labeled with them, we sort of back right off. And um, so this is where I would say, look, you know, like I was saying about the burning house, Go in there, get the treasure, and get out. Uh, it, and it's like that with anyone in the academy. If you're going to read Dan Wallace's material, um, get what you can and leave. You know. Um, unfortunately, it's, if we had a perfect world and we had, you know, um, a shining example of Christianity who was doing all this stuff, and we could, I could show you their videos, I would. And there, there probably are people out there, you know, who even do a better job. But like it's like this language transfer. I have no idea who this guy is. He could be the disco guy snorting cocaine, doing whatever, and it's like we're learning a language. You know, that's it's sort of a neutral type of thing. Um, so anyway, back to Matthew. So the pronunciation I've got here is the modern pronunciation, Vivlos. Uh, I'll just make that a tiny bit smaller. So it usually fits into the one Biblos, Genesius, Yesu, Christu, Huyo David, Huyo Abraham. And so if we were to listen to, I'll just quickly jump on my Spotify here. Um, I've got the um, Faith Comes by Hearing. If, you're, if you've got Spotify, you can just type in, um, this is the 1904 ecumenical patriarchal text. But you can get other, you know, Stephanus and, uh, sorry, uh, Scrivener, um, the, the one that I was just showing you. But this will have things like... <laughs> Άγιον Ευαγγέλιον. Βιβλός. Κατά Ματθαίον, κεφάλαιο πρώτον. Βίβλος γενέσεως Ιησού Χριστού, Ιού Δαβίδ, Ιού Αβραάμ. So he actually almost says just you, David, you, Abraham. So I've got we, we, um, sometimes we make these a little bit too fancy, but we want to get the exact pronunciation. And it is quite important if we're learning the language, we want to be fluent in it. And so, yeah, it has the Strong's numbers, it has the Greek, it has the modern pronunciation, 1611, 1900, 2016. Uh, it has different parts of speech. So the, these are all nouns, the case, the nominative, genitive. And so we're going to go through those as we define these. But we're not going to define these until we look at the different TR editions. We're going to look at the different English editions and... Um, 
we're going to look at um, hopefully we can sort of look at a few modern um, so not modern uh, a few foreign language editions and so um, I'll be revisiting this sort of at the end and so that way we can go through and um, look at the Greek we can look at the English and we can work out some things there so but let's just go through a basic commentary on this. So I'll just enlarge on this. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is the opening verse of the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament. And so one thing that I, I do want to do, I want to do a video on, you know, did Matthew write the Gospel? What about um, the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew? We want to talk about all that. But I really wanted to start in the scriptures rather than getting into all that type of argumentation. We will cover those things, but um, not at the moment. We just have to sort of start somewhere. I, I could have started with, um, you know, who wrote Matthew and then gone on to um, you know, an overview of Matthew. But I, I just thought, let's just jump straight into the scriptures. And so, um, but we will do those type of videos and we will look at all those as um as time permits, and also as um, good relevant um, studies come into my hand as well. So I've got a pretty good grasp on, you know, who wrote uh, Matthew and about the Hebrew ed edition as well. And I've got some good things to say about that, but um, we'll probably do like a whole program on that because it's quite important. Um, I know in my last video, I was sort of like, you know, Matthew wrote it. And so this is one of the things too, it's, it sort of gets into an area where it's like sometimes you can be arguing things that you're completely convinced of and you can't really be bothered trying to convince people if if they don't know you know it's like it's not something i'm struggling with it's not something i'm really that curious about because i i think matthew wrote it and that's it you know but um it i was sort of a bit convicted there are things that i really should um you know, I, I do know a fair bit about the authorship of a lot of books because uh, many times I'm listening to things and reading things that come against Bart Ehrman's concepts. And so in the process of that, they're, they're defending, you know, oh, Matthew wrote this and here's the early church writings and here's Papias, he said this. And and so you go through all that and it's it's like a wealth of information. I really should use that and... and um, that can be important to a lot of people just because it's not important to me doesn't mean it's not important to someone out there so i really should um do those things even though I, it's sort of like i'm fighting someone else's battle you know what i'm saying but um let's just keep going through since matthew is traditionally placed uh as the first of four gospels this verse commonly serves as the opening um to the entire new testament it is a sentence without a verb and is more of a heading for what follows in verse 18. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Let's just jump in, into verse 18. So, <clears throat> so it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is more of a heading, a bit like, um, so I wrote here, the verse is a standalone verse, much like how Mark 1.1, 1, 1, in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then continues on with the introduction of John the Baptist. Matthew 1.1 1, 1, mentions Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abraham, but then changes course and speaks of the genealogy of Joseph, Jesus' stepfather and not of Jesus himself. So this is very controversial, um, what I'm saying here. So basically when you go to Mark, so uh, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, I'll just actually go to Mark 1 so we can look at the context. Um, so the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so here we are, Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then straight away it's talking about John the Baptist. 
as it is written in the pro prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face. Um, and it goes through all the things to do with John the Baptist, and then he meets Jesus. So this verse here is sort of like an intro, um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is very similar where, you know, we've got the book of the generation of, the, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it's got the full stop there. So even in, in Mark, it, it's got the uh, semicolon there. So that would relate to um, you know, further further on, in a sense, or well, basically these are sort of considered, you know, as part of the same. But um, you can you can sense the that that whole entire sentence is like a standalone title. And with Matthew one one, this is a standalone title. This is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, the key word we're going to be looking at is generation, because this word generation has been interpreted or reinterpreted as the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And if you notice what I just said down here, I clearly said that, um, you know, it's a standalone verse and it mentions Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abraham. So it mentions those things, but then it changes course. So verse two changes course and speaks of the genealogy of Joseph. Jesus' stepfather and not of Jesus himself. So when you have the New King James with um, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, it actually is coming against the virgin birth because is it the genealogy of Jesus? Is that the genealogy of Jesus Christ? No, the genealogy of, of Jesus is actually, if the only one who is related to Jesus is Mary, okay? Joseph wasn't related to Jesus. Now he was part of he was in his house, so that's why it mentions this. But it's not Jesus's actual lineage. And so uh, and actually this lineage is there to show you that um Joseph his lineage was cursed and it was said that the Messiah would not come through his lineage. So when you have, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and then you have cursed Jeconiah in that list, and it says, um, the, the Old Testament says to Jeconiah that he could never uh, have, he will never have his seed sitting on the throne of David. So obviously that can happen to Joseph and his side, but Jesus is not from Joseph. But when you have this as the genealogy of Jesus, it's like it, it just throws a spanner right in the works. So what does the word mean? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The book of the generation, if we understand what generation means, generation means um, to be gen to, for something to be generated, like a, a generator. You've got a generator in your backyard you might use. Um, you know, if there's a storm or whatever, in an emergency, or if you're in a rural area, you know, use generators. And um, that produces something. Now, that word produce, it's it's like if I read this verse in like an amplified sort of way, it's the book of what Jesus Christ generated or what he produced. This is the book all about what Jesus Christ has produced. This is a book about all that Jesus Christ did and produced, what he generated. This is what generated out of Christ. And he is the son of David and he is the son of Abraham. So there are some titles there. But this goes back. And so we're going to look at this. So I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. But the first thing we want to look at is the word book, okay? And so I encourage interaction because I know what I'm saying is controversial. Matthew specifically wrote this to prove Joseph was not the father of Jesus. Exactly. And that's why most of the commentators are like, oh, my gosh, Ruth's in there. She Was she even a Jew and all this stuff? And it's like he's actually pointing out the bad things of a genealogy, <laughs> when you go through it i'm sort of scrolling down this page for no reason 
I'm sorry about that. So, okay, so we're just in the first initial stages, so I'm giving you a bit of a taste of what we're going to be looking at. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is a small but significant part of hundreds of fulfilled Old Testament prophecies concerning the Jewish Messiah. In Genesis 3.15, 4,000 years before it came to pass, it was spoken that the seed of the woman, so that's talking about Jesus, he's the seed of the woman, would bruise the serpent's head. Uh, in Genesis 22, 18, Abraham was told, In thy seed shall all the nations of, I've got, it should say, the earth be blessed. And so um, this descendant or seed would be an Israelite of the tribe of Judah, the kingly, um, the kingly tribe, so Matthew 1, 1, of the seed of David. So that's 2 Samuel 7, uh, 12 to 13. So I might actually just quickly go there. We'll just see what that's got to say. Uh, 12 to 13. It says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Okay. So I won't read through all of these, but this is just to give you a bit of an idea of what's happening here. Um, so it's of the seed of David, the exact place of his birth, Bethlehem of Judea, was foretold. So in Micah 5 2, it says um, about Ephlehem, uh, sorry, Bethlehem Ephratah. Uh, thou art not um, the smallest among the people of Israel. I may as well just go there and read it. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth, goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so... Um, great prophecy about jesus christ the modern versions destroy that but um that's a very good uh, prophecy so it's in bethlehem um of judea but it's also bethlehem ephratah so ephratah was like a, a little suburb of, of uh, bethlehem um as was the very time of the messiah's appearing and so let's just quickly look at that um, so what was that? Genesis uh, 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, till Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So that's interesting. Um, the future appearing. So then we've got the Daniel um, prophecy. So basically it talks about there will be 69 weeks and in hebrew terminology weeks just means sevens it was very clear to them there would be 69 sevens and so that's se sevens of years so when you add all that up it's 483 years would happen between the writing to the decree to rebuild jerusalem when that was written until the messiah and so when you go back and you add up all those years you come to the exact day on Palm Sunday where Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers its chicks, but you were not willing. Um, you've you missed the day of your visitation. This is their day. This is the, the, the fulfillment of the 69 weeks of Daniel. Then in Daniel, it says that the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. He's cut off for the people, for the um, nation of Israel and for the Gentiles, he'd be cut off. Um, and then it talks about the 70th week happening. So that's why we believe the 69 weeks have been fulfilled in the week of Jesus Christ. And that was also the same week of the Passover lamb. Um, so on that Sunday, that that was the 10th of Nisan. So they were to get the lambs and bring in, bring these lambs into their house. And then on the 14th in, in the evening, they were to kill these lambs. So that's why... Um, I believe that Jesus died on the Thursday evening. I know people like Chuck Missler and a few others, they say Wednesday. You know, uh, Many other people say Friday. Thursday just makes sense with the three days and three nights and according to the Jewish calendar. But also it fits in with this prophecy. 
And so um, you have on the 14th in the evening, the Passover lambs were killed. That's the exact time that Jesus died. And so Jesus actually didn't celebrate the Passover with his disciples. He was supposed to do that, but he was the Lamb of God on the cross. Um, they were they were preparing for that. So the night before was the preparation of the Passover. But it was on the 14th because they um, they go from sundown to sundown. So the sun and... Um, just before the sun had gone down, um, th that that was like the 13th. And then, so that would have been uh, Wednesday. And then in the evening, that was the 14th on the Wednesday, like after like six o'clock sort of thing. So um, follow in truth, LJs. Finally, someone else says Thursday, I have a huge writing proving this. That's great. If you've got any information on that, we'd love to uh, spread that around. Um, yeah, I've sort of followed that for many years. And so, yeah, that's the 70-week Daniel prophecy. All the seven-year period is in the future. So that's why it's a seven-year tribulation, because they were literal seven years um, until the fulfillment in Christ. He was cut off, and then you have the fulfillment. And so uh, a lot of the time, prophecy is written in that way because Jesus, God had to trick Satan if Satan had known what would have happened, that Jesus Christ would have risen from the dead and, you know, all that sort of stuff, he would never have crucified the Son of Glory. But because he thought that Jesus was going to come, set up his kingdom, and just like the Jews sort of thought that, um, he would have, he thought that that was going to happen. So he thought by killing him, he was actually get, getting rid of him. And so... Um, but he was tricked. And so what you've got to understand is a lot of these prophecies, they will talk about these meticulous details and then they'll skip like 2,000 years and talk about the future. They talk about the millennium and it's like it just skips right over it. And so um, in the 70th week of Daniel, you have the 69 weeks and the 70th week, it's sort of like, oh, this 70th week prophecy, yet yeah, there's a 2,000 year gap between them. And so, and that's why I like dispensationalism. I'm a dis dispy person myself but um anyway there you go so there are um sorry then there were prophecies of his rejection by his own kinsmen so isaiah 53 uh, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed <clears throat> isaiah 52 so I'll just go to 53, sorry, verse 2. Um, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we esteem him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So great uh, messianic prophecies there. Um it's interest, interesting. Um, so this uh, whole verse is attacked by Michael Heiser and also the Text and Canon Institute of um, Peter Mead. And um, is it Peter Mead? No, it's not Peter Mead, is it? Mead and Gurry, I'll just say that. Anyway, so let's go back to where we were. Okay, and so... They despise their long-awaited king, the very hope of Israel. These prophecies were pre predicted centuries before. The details about his death and its very manner were fulfilled to the letter. There were over 50 prophecies um, precisely fulfilled on the day of the crucifixion alone. The prophecies of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 with the New Testament accounts of the crucifixion are common examples of New Testament literature in the Old Testament. And so, um, uh, 
Yeah. So let's look at the book. Okay, so we're going to um, sort of define what the book is. Vivlos is translated the book and not simply book due to the normal use of anatharist nouns in titles. So anatharist is from an and arthurus um, from ancient Greek uh, arthon, meaning joint. It's a, a grammatical article. This negates the need for italics here in the article, the. And arthurus nouns are gen generally translated into English with the indefinite article an or a and an. There are some anatharist nouns which are qualitative and are often translated without an article. Anatharist in grammar simply means without the article. In English, we have both the definite article, the, and the indefinite article, a, but in Greek, there is no indefinite article. Okay, so um, when it comes to translation, you're, you're translating from one set of rules to another set of rules. And so um, many times people will look at italics or look at certain ways English is structured compared to the Greek and they say, oh, it's different. Um, that's just because they, they have different grammatical um, rules. Uh, the ending of this noun, os, tells us it's in the nominative case. So vivlos is the inner bark of the papyrus plant. So let's get a, a picture of papyrus. So this papyrus plant, um, so here's, here's some papyrus here, some writings. And so they used to <clears throat> get this plant and they would... Um, you know, take out all the inside of the stem of it and they would lay it all down and, and um, roll it and they sort of did a crisscross pattern over it and they'd roll it and they'd dry it out and that became paper. It's actually where we get our word paper, it's papyrus. So, um, okay, so the papyrus plant, which was made into a written book, a sheet or scroll of writing, uh, there are seven meanings revealed in scripture, okay? So the first is used here as a book or a scroll. And so talking about, you know, Matthew, this is the book of something. So it's a book, it's a scroll. Uh, concerning the Pentateuch as the book of Moses, that's in Mark uh, 12, uh, 27. Uh, regarding the book of the words of Isaiah that Jesus read, so uh, Luke 3, 4, so... Uh, he stood up and read from that, the book of the words of Isaiah. Uh, the book of Psalms in Luke 20, 42 and in Acts 1, 20. As the book of the prophets in Acts uh, 7, 42. As the book of life in Philippians 4, 3, Revelation 3, 5 and Revelations or the, the book of the Revelation uh, 20, 15 and uh, of secular writings in Acts 19.19 when they burnt all their um, bizarre books that they had. And so there is a link here. I'll just quickly go to that. That shows you scriptures containing 976. So this is the Strong's number, 976. So this just shows you um, where Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Philippians, Revelation, this shows you everywhere that this word appears. And at the end, I've got like, that's Vivlos, Vivlu, so it's in the dative, it's got the iota subscript there. Um, and that's in most of them, um, Biblos, and so that's talking about books, plural, um, back to the dative. And so when you... You, you can go through this on my website and you can basically one thing I've found with defining words, if you get the Greek number, and this is another tool that I use, and I'm actually trying to just basically copy all of this into my website. So this is online Bible. It's been around since the nineties. 
I know a lot of people use Logos and all the rest of it, and it's probably way better, but it's I, I find this very helpful. And um, in my studies, I've used this a lot. Now, I'll just drag this over if I possibly can. Okay, it's just loading up everything. Oops. I think... There we go. Lots of pages open on that. It failed. I think I've just got too many things open. So anyway, on that site, it, it just basically has the words, and it has it in this type of format where you've got the number next to the word. And so um, you can go through and you can just search for 976 in the authorized version and basically um, all of these will come up. So it's good to do a study like that. Um, sometimes people only study in Strong's. They study through and look at the English word. It's like, okay, let's look at book. So if we were to do, just to look at book, there would be a lot more there. But this is only to do with Vivlos, the actual word. So there's uh, Vivlion, which is a different type of book and so um yeah so that that's interesting to look at that as well but um for the moment we're just looking through this so i just sort of show you that that scripture is containing that so i'm trying to do that with every um every greek word and also it's um linkable so the book here if we go there, I've got quite a lot written on this. So vivlos, um, it's a primitive root. It's a noun, nominative, singular, feminine. So it appears 13 times. A written book, a roll, or a scroll. Um, vivlos is translated as the book in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and not simply a book. So I went through that, the Anathras nouns. I've already gone through that. That's all in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Um, and I'm about to go through most of that. So then in the King James Version, I've got what it's translated as, um, the book. So here it has books. Um, what uh, the King James um, 1900, the 1611 Bishop's Bible, etc., has down to the Textus Receptus. Um, and in the TR, what the different forms of the Greek, uh, where they appear, and uh, in some of the languages. So this is just, you know, a small sample. So the book, uh, Libri, Vivlos, uh, Libro, so we might get library and a few other words from the, the Italian or the, or the Latin, really, Liber. And, yeah, so that's a basic sort of article on the definition of Vivlos there. So... Let's just go back to um, our article here. So Helga said, uh, Matthew 117, Babylon is pure genitive in Greek, very rare use of the genitive into Babylon. But Reformation translators were sensitive enough to get it right. Geneva Bishops, King James Version. That's very interesting. And... Um, yeah, when we get to 117, we'll, um, we'll, we'll definitely look at that. If you can remind me about that, that'll be great. Um, they were sensitive in their handling of the original language text, and even Young's literal is not really literal in rendering the Babylonian removal. Okay, so that's a very interesting point you brought out there. Um, Helgi... So I'll keep reading through this. The English word Bible stems from Greek vivlos. Interestingly, English, the English word paper comes from papyrus via Latin from Greek um, papyrus. Um, papyrus. Um, the Greek writer Theophrastus, who flourished during the 4th century BC, used papyrus when referring to the plant used as a foodstuff and bublos for the same plant when used for non-food products, such as corkage, bark, 
um, basketry um, or a writing surface. The more specific term, um, biblos, which finds its way into English in such words as bibliography, bibliophile, and Bible, refers to the inner bark of the papyrus plant. Papyrus is also the etymon of paper, a similar substance. A folio bor borrowed from Latin, um, folio, is the ablative singular form of folium, a sheet, a sheet of uh, or leaf of paper um, related to foliage. The Greek word for papyrus as writing material, uh, viblion, so this, that's the other Greek word, uh, and book, viblos, come from the ancient port biblos, uh, Lebanese Arabic pronunciation, Gebal, which is a Mediterranean city in the Mount Lebanon governorate, uh, Lebanon. Um, Gebal appears in the Hebrew Bible under the name Gebal. This same means boundary district or mountain peak. So let's look at Gebal. I'm going to quickly go to, oops, that is the wrong thing to copy. Copy that. And we can actually go to Biblos in Lebanon. How amazing. This is really cool. So that's the ancient port city. Um, it would be so good to do a Holy Land type of tour. And so that's where I was last night at Durga Indian Cuisine in Queensland and Sunpak, where we saw um, some Kowali singers, which is really interesting. Um, all from Pakistan. So Biblos. So let's just zoom in a little bit there. Amazing that we can look at an old ancient city like this. Um, let's just zoom out and we'll find out where it is in relation to Israel. Okay, so you got Beirut down here. Um, and I guess it's not just so much Israel, but we're looking at... So where was it again? Of, Now I've lost it. Okay, so I'm wasting our time. But, um, yeah, so it's near Beirut, basically. So here we have, you know, the Egyptian Empire. you have, you got, um, you know, Athens over here, the Greek Empire. You've got all sorts of other empires. And so Vivlos was a main port. Um, so let's have another look. The ancients of Gabal, so this is in the King James, the ancients of Gabal and the wise men thereof um, were in thee, thy caucus. All the ships of the sea with their manners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise, Ezekiel uh, 27, 9 in the King James. But notice in the NIV, it's paraphrased as Biblos. Um, veteran craftsmen of Biblos were on board as shipwrights to cork your seams. All the ships of the sea and their sailors became alongside, sorry, came alongside to trade for your wares. So the ancient um, Greek bublos, where we get our modern biblos, was the interpretation of gabal. So I've just sort of shown that to in the King James, it's gabal, and the NIV, NIV, it's biblos. Papyrus received its early Greek name, Bublos, uh, from its importation from Egypt to Greece, to the uh, Aegean uh, through this city. The ancient Greek word Biblos, or Vivlos, diminutive uh, Viblion, um, plural Vivloi, diminutive uh, Viblia, and ultimately the word Bible, the papyrus book, Hence, the Holy Bible derived from that name. During the old Egyptian kingdom, uh, Biblos was virtually an Egyptian colony. So that's quite interesting um, because we know of a lot of Egyptian writings. Um, first dynasty tombs used timbers from Biblos. One of the oldest Egyptian words for an ongoing, sorry, for an ocean-going boat was a Biblos ship. 
Many ancient Egyptian objects have been found in Byblos. Because beech wood tablets were common, so we're sort of getting into the uh, English language here, because beech wood tablets were common in writing material in Germanic societies before the development of paper, Old English bok and Old Norse bok both have the primary sense of beech, but also a secondary sense of book, and it is from bok that the modern word derives. In modern German, the word for book is book. I'm not sure how you pronounce that in German. Um, with book uh, with the E on the end, meaning beech tree. In the Swedish language, these words are the same, bok meaning both beech tree and book. Um, similarly, in Slavic languages, for example, Russian, Bulgarian, and Macedonian, um, bukva means letter, is cognate with beech. In Russian and Serbian and Macedonian, um, the word bukva, bukva refers specifically to primary school textbook that helps young children to master the techniques of reading and writing. It is thus uh, conjectured, conject, conjectured <laughs> um, that the earliest Indo-European writings may have been carved onto beech wood. Similarly, the Latin word codex, meaning book, in the modern sense, bound with separate leaves, originally meant block of wood. And so I've got a few different articles that people can go to there and look at that. So the annotations of Theodore Beza written there, I don't have a, um, that's a 1556 and the 1598. So I don't have a translation for that. So that's just um, scholarly curiosity and Edward Lee, uh, he writes here. So it's, I don't, I don't really have any real reason for to have Edward Lee except for just, I found his material and put it there with a the link. So eventually I'll, I'll study that. But first I just want to see what uh, Image Bear is saying. Apparently there, there's a KJV versus modern version debate on standing for truth in 30 minutes. Oh, that'll be interesting. I might just have a quick look. Um, okay, let's have a look. Um, standing. Truth. Yeah, Bible translation debate upcoming for waiting at 11. Okay, yeah, so it's in, it's very soon. So David Preston. So I actually don't know David Preston, but um, yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting thing to do. I guess I'll, you know, by then it'll be nearly three hours and so I'll probably will be finished here and we can go through that maybe um but I want to just keep going through this and so but thanks for the heads up I'll just shut that because I've got so many windows open I don't want to um clog up all my bandwidth so then we come to the real issue of this verse um of the generation so genesis of the generation means something that has been generated. In this case, it is what Jesus Christ has generated. So it's not so much that Jesus Christ was generated, it what's, it's what Jesus Christ has generated. The genealogy beginning in verse 2 um, mentioned is of Joseph and not Jesus. Thus, the New King James Version's um, translation is in error, having the genealogy of Jesus Christ because Christ had no genealogy except through his mother. Um, nowhere else in the New Testament does the book refer to anything other than an entire work. So it is erroneous to conclude that this is only concerned with the listed genealogy. So this is one of the things people um, might translate it as a role of Jesus's genealogy, or this is a list of, you know, so Biblos gets regulated to, oh, this is a, a, a little intro uh, sort of thing where it's no, it's talking about the whole book of Matthew. And so in the King James Version, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 has a, um, Genesis uh, translated as generation. 
um, also translated as nature. So it's in James as nature. So it's what how we're born as we 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 are. Um, that's who we are. You know. So uh, never as birth, nor as genealogy, which is um, a separate and distinct word used in the pastorals. So genealogy, you know, obviously it talks about gene genealogies and things like that, but it doesn't use this word. So let's just have a look at the basic um, etymology. There are hundreds of GN sounding words that appear in the etymology of Indo-European languages such as Latin, Greek and English. The GN sounding is usually associ associated with production, birth or origin such as Genesis. So this is just a roundabout, you know, talking about GN sounding words. This this is not specific to um, gen Genesis or generation, but um, it's just a broad sort of um, explanation to do with all of these type of words that sound like this. So the GN sounding is usually associated with production, birth or origin, such as Genesis, beginning, origin, so the GN beginning, uh, genetics, progenitors, uh, gender, genitals, pregnancy, the GN, um, progeny, um, congenial, indigenous, genius, genre, generation, etc. A Latin example will be in Matthew 125, where primogenitum is used for firstborn. And so that is um, that is changed in the modern versions, actually, where um, uh, her firstborn son, um, the Latin gen means a clan. Gens means a clan. From Hebrew, uh, Gentiles are foreigners. The gen is in there as well. All these words is quite interesting. When you see GN, you know it has something to do with production. In Greek, there are many, even in the first chapter of Matthew, with uh, a genese from um, geneo, meaning translated as begat or begot. And so um, just as nat has a silent G, we just say nat, we don't say genat. Some GN sounding words also drop the G, such as Noel or Gnoel, the first Noel. Um, the nativity it just became nativity. Uh, other examples are nation, nature, innate, benign, used to mean uh, used to mean well born. Um, the opposite was malign, but the G sound is maintained in benig and malignant the root of this verb um, gene not is gene not gen you can see in other compound forms such as genitor um, which corresponds to the latin genitor sanskrit um, genitar so it's quite an interesting study to go through these gn words and, and it gives you an understanding of the english and how that works um and so in matthew in, in matthew one there are so many gn words you know even like we're looking at the nativity um you know we we, we would sing songs the first noel and it's, it's originally noel you know and um you know genesis these type of concepts generation um you know the the, the firstborn um So the exact phrase, uh, vivlos genesios, is used in um, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, uh, in the so-called uh, Greek Septuagint. Genesios is used in Genesis uh, 2, 4, which is correct um, because it concerns what originated from God's creation, which also may include the genealogies of men, um, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is applied to what Christ generated. So um, it's quite interesting if we look at, this is in the Septuagint. It has, um, after a Vivlos Genesios, 
um, Uranu. So um, that's the book of the generation there. So in Genesis 5.1, it also has um, after a Vivlos, Genesius, Anthropon. And so it's quite interesting that this word Vivlos is put in there in Genesis 2.4 when it shouldn't be there. That's not in the Masoretic text. So to me, they've copied this from Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and put it into this text. So a lot of studies would go back from Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and go back to this, explaining what um, Genesios means, but they've accidentally sort of pasted that in there with it and so uh, where it shouldn't be in there. So that's the Alex X for you. It's got all, all the time. It's got these New Testament type of readings in the old testament and some of them are just stupid and don't make any sense like this one um and so i'll, I'll just read what that is in english um these are the generations so it doesn't say these are the book of the generations these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the lord god made the heaven made the earth and the heavens so let's just have a look at that for the moment because we know that the word uh, genesios uh, is relative to the Hebrew here, um, which is um, Toledoth, I'm pretty sure. So Toledoth. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Toledoth. And so... These are the generations of the heaven and the earth in the day that they were created. So um, if it, it doesn't say these are the, this is the genealogy of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens. It says these are the generations of the heaven and earth. So in other words, it's saying this is what was produced from the heaven and the earth in the day that the Lord God made the heavens. And we'll go to the context. Um, so thus the heavens and the earth were finished. The seventh day God rested. God blessed the seventh day. And these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. And then, so then it goes on to what, yeah, so God started that, and then this is what happened afterwards. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So this is all the stuff that happened after... Um, you know, this is what generated from the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God created the heaven and the earth and so, or the earth and the heavens. And so that kind of defines Matthew 1.1 1, 1 with, with generation. So we're going to see this um, very soon. So Vivlos um, in Vivlos Genesio. So in Genesis 5 1, sorry, I should really go there. Um, I'll just shut that down and that one and that one and that one. Um, it has this is the book of the generations of Adam. So it's the same Greek as um, uh, corresponding to the Hebrew, of course. There's the same Greek that's in Matthew 1 1, and this is correct. So the other one has book for no reason. In the LXX, showing the LXX is just filled with errors. Um, but this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of he, him. So this is um, the book of what came from Adam. Okay. And then it has a genealogy because that's what came from Adam. So we ha if we have a genealogy of what came from Jesus, the church came from Jesus. We come from Jesus, the church, the bride, the the, re the resurrection came from Jesus. The the the, the disi discipleship came from Jesus. Healing came from Jesus. Grace came from Jesus. All that. 
comes from this is the book of what jesus christ generated this is the book of what jesus christ produced this is the all the book all about what jesus christ did rather than this is a genealogy of jesus yeah <clears throat> The Biblos in Biblos Genesios in Genesis uh, 2 4 is an addition which just does not appear in the original Hebrew. It was most probably copied from Matthew 1 1 into Genesis 2 4, erroneously carrying the Biblos with it, um, which is more proof of a, a reverse engineered LXX from the New Testament. The Hebrew f f phrase, the book of the genealogy, uh, Sefer Toledoth, is um, frequent in Jewish writings. The other genealogy concerning the lineage of the family of Jesus appears in Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 23 to 38. So um, we'll be looking at that uh, as we go through the gene genealogy um, of Joseph. Um, the phrase Vivlos Genesius is not merely a title for the first part of the Gospel of Matthew. So it's important to know that because a lot of people say, oh, well, the book of the generate this is just a book about jesus's family tree you know no this is a book of, about everything that jesus produced he's the son of david the son of abraham and while we're talking about genealogies let's talk about his stepdad that's what what it says you know and verse 2 to verse uh, 17 is all about joseph and his his genealogy it is the title of the gospel of matthew and perhaps by default the entire new testament itself it must be noted that the generation Jesus Christ applies to everything Christ generated, including his life, death, resurrection, and making of the church. Cursed Jeconiah. Okay. Because Jeconiah was cursed, in no way can the lineage of Joseph be part of the lineage of Jesus, as many modern, Bible, modern versions of the Bible mistakenly claim by changing the English reading of generation to genealogy or lineage. So you can see what I'm getting at when I'm saying there's an error here. So when we go through English versions, um, these ones follow the concept of generation. Okay. So we've got Wessex, Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthew, Great Bible, Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, King James Bible, other editions of the King James Bible that followed from that, the Webster's Bible, Etheridge, um, the Smith, Julius Smith translation, and the 2016 that I've worked on all have generation there. So this is the thing when it comes to why have you put generation instead of genealogy? The, the New King James has um, genealogy. Why don't you follow that? And it's like, well, this is this is my reasoning why. So following history, because some of the some of them have this reading, the history of the life of Jesus Christ. It's, it's actually more accurate than genealogy. The history of the life of Jesus Christ. So this is where I said that the Jehovah's Witness Bible is more accurate than half of these modern. It's more accurate here than the New King James. <laughs> it's less heretical. How's that? <laughs> it just amazes me. The history of the life of Jesus Christ. That was in the Mace New Testament, 1729. The history of Jesus Christ, Living Oracles by Alexander Campbell in 1835. The book of the history. So that's um, the New World Translation, 1984, um, with a footnote or line of descent or origin. See, they, they love toying with this is the or this is where Michael the Archangel had his origin, you know, sort of thing. It's like um, it's a strange thing because I guess they, they do differ where some people would just say there's what that's where Jesus originated from, but they've got the Michael the Archangel story where he's sort of popped his head up as Jesus, you know, it's, it's very strange. So they didn't go with that, they went with the history, the historical record of Jesus Christ is the Holman um, standard, and so a footnote or the book of the genealogy. So how's that? The historical record of Jesus Christ. And that's in the Holmans. So I think they were understanding that genealogy um, is deficient. The book of the history. So that's the, the newest New World Translation in 2013. A footnote or genealogy. This is the record of the life of Jesus, the Messiah. The International Standard Version 
2012 um, with a footnote or birth. Um, so that has life. So I guess that equates to sort of history. So following genealogy, we have the Murdoch translation of um, 1851, Young's Literal, The Role of the Birth um, in um, 1862. This is the genealogy in uh, NIB, 1973. The Book of the Genealogy, um, New King James Version, 1982, with a footnote, literally generation. So you notice they're saying genealogy literally means generation. So they're, they're synonyms. So that's what the New King James is claiming here. Okay. Greens has the book of the uh, genealogy. Um, the uh, revised Young's has a role of the birth in 2000. Um, the web, the World English Bible 2000 has the book of the genealogy. Um, the New Living Translation has, this is a record of the ancestors, um, 2007. Uh, the English Majority Text Version has the Book of the Genealogy, 2009. And um, Book of the Genealogy is in the MEV. Okay, so we're seeing the two major players for the TR, genealogy, genealogy. So New King James has genealogy and the Modern English Version has genealogy. Another issue is that while the King James Version correctly has a full stop at the end of the verse, as does the Greek, which is indicating the end of the sentence, modern versions have a semicolon indicating that the genealogy um, following is of Jesus. For example, um, in the King James, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, full stop. New King James has the book of the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, um, semicolon or colon, semicolon. And so another issue is that most modern versions are translating book or vivlos twice. The New King James, for example, says the book of the genealogy. So uh, log logi or logi means book. So basically it says the book of the family tree book. Yeah, in a, in a roundabout way. Hebrews 3, 7 says that this is talking about Jesus without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abideth a priest continuously. So that's talking about Melchizedek. Um, he's a type of Christ, but it's saying that he is made like unto the son of God. He abides a priest continuously. Um, so there's nothing written about his mother or father, you know, all that sort of stuff. But um, there is a similarity, similarity with Christ where um, Christ, through his mother, he has a lineage, but um, through his father, he, he doesn't. So it's an interesting verse that I put there. I guess that could be, you know, read either way. But I've just put it there anyway. Um, some people have felt that that's important, so I've thrown it in there. So Chrysostom, uh, he has in homilies in Matthew 2, or he therefore entitles it the book of the generation because this is the sum of the whole dispensation, the root of all its blessings. Um, viz 10, that God became man, for this once affected all things uh, followed, of course. All other things followed, of course. So, yeah, the book about um, what Christ did. So he was, um, God was manifest in the flesh, and this is what happened because of that. Um, okay, da da da. And so some of this stuff I've got here is written. It's I'm not really actually that sure about it, um, but I've just like I said, I've I copied I copy and paste stuff here all the time. Um, so I've got um, Ginozo Manetti's New Testament. So I think I've just put that there so I know where to link to it. <laughs> I've got a picture of it. Have, haven't got anything written from it. I've got Erasmus as a heading there with nothing under it. Now I've got Theodore Beza's uh, Genesis, uh, but that's in 
um, Latin, so it doesn't really help that much. And then uh, Piscator, and that's all in Latin, so it doesn't really help that much. But I've got a nice picture of Erasmus there, nice picture of Beezus 1598. Then I've got King James Version as a title, and I don't have anything written under that. And then I've got, um, so sometimes it's just a whole bunch of stuff there, and it's like, okay, well, there you go. And But I do have some nice pictures of, so when we go to the um, the 1598 of Beezer, um, so he has here, you know, Liber in the Latin, and then Vivlos, and then he talks about Genesis 5.1, um, basically saying that the Jews, from what I can gather, the, the Jews were sort of trying to make out that this is a genealogy of Jesus, um, which modern Bibles actually follow, where it it's more relates to um, the the concept that this is what Jesus generated, and so uh, that's quite in, quite an interesting thing. I wish I knew Latin; um, it would be great to you know go through this. So we have um, the King James Version talks uh, quite a bit about the genealogy um, in the prefatorial material, the lineage of our blessed Savior, which is our principal, um, is that help or scope or scope, I think it says, is known by a chain-like trail continued from Adam to Shem. Uh, and so it goes on about this type of thing. So that's all interesting there. And then we have that other um, th that other bit of material that we're looking at. So Joseph and Mary, they've shaken hands. So Joseph was by the law. Mary was by nature. And so then we have Christ. Uh, and so um, these two joined together. But Jesus only came through here because we know that cursed Jeconiah was in this um, lineage of joseph so by saying that this is the book of the gene the genealogy of jesus and you've got a cursed guy in there um it doesn't really make much theological sense either either um okay so adam clark in his commentary adam clark in his commentary said the book of the generation of jesus christ i suppose these words to have been the original title to this gospel and that they signify, according to Hebrew phraseology, not only the account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, as detailed below, but the history of his birth, acts, sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension. So this is where I, did, I would differ. I would say it's not the genealogy of Christ. Uh, I would say that's the genealogy of um, Joseph. And so um, I, I would make that distinction there. The phrase, the book of the generation, Sefer Toledoth, is frequent in Jewish writings and is translated by the Septuagint of Ibelos Genesios as here by the evangelist and regularly conveys the meaning given to it above. This is the book of the generations of Adam, um, Genesis 5.1. That is the account of the life of Adam and certain of his immediate descendants. Again, these are the generations of uh, Jacob, uh, Genesis um uh, 37 2 that is the account of the history of uh, Jacob and his son Joseph and the other remarkable uh, branches of his family and again these are the generations of Aaron and Moses numbers 3 1 that is the history of the life and acts of these persons and some of their immediate descendants the same form of expression is also used Genesis 2 4 when giving the history of the creation of the heavens and the earth so you can see uh, Adam Clark caught, has caught on to this concept. It's the, it's the history. It's what's being produced from these people. So it's like, okay, so this is the history of the book of Adam, and then it's got his descendants, and then it's got what his descendants did. Then it's like, okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, ja the history of the generation of Jacob. So it's Jacob, and then, then it talks about who uh, he produced and then what they also produced in their life. So when we've got the history of Jesus, we, the church, are what he produced. We are the sons um, of God. He's made us sons of God. He's produced his church. We are his bride and all that sort of stuff. And so it's an interesting thing. Just to get out of Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it's quite an interesting thing. Um, so some have translated uh, Vilos Genesios, the book of the genealogy, and consider it a title to this chapter only. But the former opinion seems better founded. 
Okay, so Adam Clark, he seems, you know, he, he missed a little bit there, but um, I would agree with most of what he's saying. Latin generationis from generatio to beget in English. The book of the beginning of Matthew starts with the genealogy, but soon after goes to the story of Christ's birth. Yeah, so it would be like Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. If you didn't have the genealogy of Joseph put in there, you would just have Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of um, David, the son of Abraham, and then it would read, the birth of Jesus Christ was like this. And so, okay, Jesus was born, um, and then, you know, this all happened to Joseph. But it's introducing Joseph's genealogy because he's mentioned in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 so frequently. It's like, okay, who's this guy? Okay, well, this is a stepdad. He's got this cursed guy, Jeconiah, in his lineage. So that can't be, he can't be the father, the biological father of Jesus Christ um, because of that cursed lineage. Um, but he is the stepfather of Christ. And so... Genesis beginning, the root gen has to do with origin and birth and coming into existence, uh, Geneo uh, Ginemai. Very good. Thanks, Helgi. Um, so we have a guy called uh, Solomon Milan, He's a very interesting guy. He's got a foot high afro, as you do with a top hat like that. Um, so Solomon uh, Caesar Milan, very educated guy. He defends the Textus Receptus and authorized version, but sometimes, uh, like Burgon, you know, sort of branches off into other areas where it's like, oh, sorry, you're wrong there, but um, I believe he's correct here. So I've attempted to write out what he's got, but it's like 30 pages. <laughs> so it, it's taken quite a while even just to get to here to get the italics correct, to get the Greek correct. It's it's a lot of work. But what he basically points out uh, to sum this up is there's a guy called Alfred. So he wrote um, a dictionary and, uh, or he actually did like a commentary. And so in that, many times he's saying things like this. Um, he's saying things like Genesis. So this is with two news of the received text, which is a probable correction from the verb so often used before, occurs in L and the rest. And then he gives his authorities for the change. And then he notes that Genesis with one new uh, must be understood in a wide sense as nearly identical in meaning with Genesis. So it's, it, they mean the same thing he's saying as ori origo and not merely birth. Um, uh, so he's got May, so that must be someone. It probably is chosen by the Holy Spirit to mark a slight distinction between Genesis of our Lord and that of ordinary men. Okay, so basically what they what he's trying to do, he's trying to make out that Genesis with one new and Genesis with two news are the same where Solomon Milan goes through and examines these claims, looking at a lot of, you know, he's looking at Plato, he's looking at a whole bunch of other guys, and basically comes to the conclusion that um, these are very separate and distinct words. So why is this important? Well, um, Genesis with the two news appears in verse 18, okay? Genesis with the one new appears in verse 1. So, Philip Schaff, in his popular commentary on the New Testament, unwittingly, so Philip Schaff, he was a liberal scholar, so he was, you know, really good friends with Westcott Horton and the other guys. I'm pretty sure he's on the translation committee, wasn't he, or the American stand, stand version, reveals there are, uh, where the error originates, that Genesis simply means birth. Um, the Westcott and Hort text error of having Genesis in um, Matthew 118 and taking out the new there and not Genesis with two news. Okay. So he has the book of the generation, then he has in brackets, or birth. The same word in Greek as in Matthew 118. 
Okay, so he's saying it's exactly the same word, where it's not. there In the TR, there is a distinction between these two. In the critical text, they only just use the one word. Okay. Literally, book of birth, birth book, that is pedigree, genealogy, the title of the genealogical table, Matthew 1, 1 to 17, not the whole gospel, nor of the two first two chapters nor of chapter one so possibly uh, the title of um, the original hebrew document used by the evangelist okay so the critical text chain takes that new out in 118 and it matches exactly with what's in verse one so because this has always historically been translated as birth they then conclude that this means birth because that they've changed it and they said Okay, so um, this is uh, the Texas Receptus reading. We're throwing that out. We've put in the new reading. So it means birth too. So that means in chapter 1, verse 1, it, that means birth as well. So they've totally redefined this word. So Dean Bergon, um, he says in Revision and Revise, um, not only do familiar parables, miracles, discourses of our Lord trip us up at every step, but we cannot open the first page of the gospel no, nor indeed read the first line without being brought to a standstill. Thus, St. Matthew begins the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Okay, good. But here, the margin volunteers two pieces of information. First, or birth, as in verse 18. So we refer to, refer to verse 18 and read, uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Good again, but the margin says all generation as in verse 1. So what's he talking about? He's talking about this here. This is the revised version in their footnote, okay? So they had the correct reading, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ in, in verse 1, and it had a, a, a note here, all the genealogy of Jesus Christ, okay? So then it has or birth, as in verse 18. So, okay, you keep reading through. Then you get to verse 18, and it has or generation, as in verse 1. So what they've done, they've made generation into to be synonymous with genealogy. Then they've made it to be synonymous with birth, as in verse 18. Then they've made the word birth, in verse 18, be synonymous with generation so it's it's all over the place um so yeah it's it's uh, it, it's they've redefined it so they've redefined this word they're all over the place with it and bergon's just pointing this out saying uh this is pretty confusing you get to the first verse and and it's and it's butchered um, so here he says, you know, all birth, as in verse 18, we refer to verse 18 and read, now the birth of Jesus Christ was in this wise, good again, but the margin says all generation, as in verse 1. Are we then to understand that the same Greek word, diversely rendered in English, occurs in both places? We refer to the new Greek text, and there it stands, Genesis, in either verse. But if the word be the same, why on the revisor's theory is it diversely rendered? So what if this verse, verse is the same, why are they have they got such a big difference in one's birth and one's generation? So but that's why they have to, you know, do this sort of shell game and it's like, how's that defined? Because they've they've mutilated um, the word underneath birth, um they they've changed it even james snap he did an article on this and he was sort of understood a little bit of it we understood what bergen was trying to get at and he said it actually that they could translate the origin of jesus christ because it's sort of like this is what christ um did or this is what jesus this is what christ produced and so when it says and the birth of jesus christ was like this it can actually be translated as the origin of Jesus Christ was like this. And so it's it's quite um, dangerous. So in the meantime, 
who knows not that there is all the difference in the world between St. Matthew's Genesis in verse 1 and the same St. Matthew's Genesis in verse 18. The latter, the evangelist announcement of the circumstances of the human nativity of Christ, the former, the, so, you know, that's verse 18, the former, the evangelist's obtrusive way of recalling the Septuagintal rendering in Genesis uh, 2, 4, and in um, there, the same evangelist claim method of guiding the devout and thoughtful student to discern the gospel in the gospel the history of the new creation thus by providing that when the first gospel opens its lips it shall syllable the name of the first book of the elder covenant we are pointing out that it is more than startles it supremely offends one who is even slenderly acquainted with the treasures of wisdom hid in the very diction of the New Testament scriptures to discover that a deliberate effort has been made to get rid of the very foremost of these notes of divine intelligence by confounding two words which all down through the ages have been carefully kept distinct and that this effort is the result of an exaggerated estimate of a few codices which happen to be written in the unctual character viz um two of the uh fourth century um b and aleph one of the fifth c and two of the sixth p and z one of the ninth um, delta and the other of the tenth uh, sigma. So, yeah, he's he's against it, and so he's basically agreeing with the position that I have, and I agree with his position. And so, I really enjoyed uh, going through um, Bergon's material, and so uh, so he goes into the manuscript evidence of verse eighteen, saying, you know, it shouldn't. Be, they should the two news there should be there there's you know there's all the evidence in the world for this um we're just following um this type of thing and he has will the revisionists still pretend to tell us that genesis in verse 18 is a plain and clear error so he's got all this information there and he just so not only is it just a textual issue this redefines the term and redefines Matthew 1 1. So, this is a bit like when you have John chapter 1, verse 18, with the um, monogamous uh, Theos, the only begotten God. They want to squeeze God into that verse. So, having something abrupt like the only begotten God, like in the New American Standard Bible, they don't want that. They want the unique God or the one of a kind God or the one and only God. So, they want to redefine monogamous. And so, instead of having monodikos, which means unique, the Greeks have had that word for 2,000 years. Um, they want to make out that uh, monogamous means unique, one of a kind. And so even verses like John 3.16, when you read through it, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's changed to for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So the monogamous there is re-translated. It's, it's, it's changed. And so um, that you sort of have to know what's happened with John chapter 1, verse 18, that they're trying to squeeze the word God in there, but it's so abrupt and so Gnostic that they're like, let's just redefine monogamous, and then we can sort of get that God in there, you know. Um, and so they have to go through every verse where monogamous uh, appears and redefine it. So this is what they've done here as well. So um, they want this greek reading under underlying the word birth in verse 18 um it had two news in it they've changed it and so um and so they've changed it to one new which d doesn't mean birth anymore it means like uh, gen generation and so then they've redefined matthew 1 1 to mean birth because they know historically that verse there is always birth in the all the English Bibles, all the 
they're everywhere. So they've got this new never seen before reading and it's like, well, we sort of have to keep that word birth there. We can't change that because it's like we're going against everything. Uh, but we can redefine Matthew 1.1 1, 1 and how that reads. But then they're attacking the virgin birth because all of a sudden it's a genealogy of Jesus with cursed Jeconiah in there. Um, and it, it just creates a mess. And so Burgon pointed this out. So I've had some people say, oh, this is just your concept and all the rest of it, but it's actually um, Dean John William Burgon, Solomon Milan. So Burgon mentions Matthew 1.1 1, 1 in the book Causes of Corruption of a Traditional Text of the Holy Gospels while speaking of the double new issue in um, Genema. So uh, he has a similar confusion between Genesis and Genesis in Matthew 1. And so he's talking about you know very intricate things in the Greek language, but this is a different word. And so we know in English, if we just change one letter, I mean, um, if you have um, cat or cot, they're very different, you know, and, and just to just say they're the same uh, is ridiculous. So the revised version of 1881 um, it reads as the King James does, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The problem is with three footnotes that firstly causes generation to be redefined as genealogy. Secondly, causes generation in the main text and genealogy in the footnote to be def defined as birth. And thirdly, birth in verse 18 to be defined as generation. So in verse uh, 1, 1, it says the book of the generation, okay, footnote or genealogy, okay. And in verse 1, 1, it says at generation or birth as in verse 18. And then in verse 18, it has at birth. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Says all generation is in verse one, so you can see the, the shell game of like, okay, we've retranslated it, and it's all over the place. They all mean sort of the same thing, you know. It's like, uh, okay, and then you can see later on they haven't been as bold to change the word generation there to genealogy, but eventually they did, and you know, New King James has jumped on board with that, unfortunately. So um, these three footnotes completely redefine generation to mean um, only birth and destroy the traditional def definition of generation meaning production so it morphs gene uh, birth and logi book thus making genesis mean birth number two by making generation mean birth it nullifies the true meaning of genesis and generation three by making birth mean generation in verse 18 it nullifies the true meaning of genesis and generation this threefold error in 1881 is repeated in the 1900 american standard version so um now i'll keep going because i know there's a debate happening but i want to we're, we're sort of on the whole thing of generation and i want to sort of finish that concept so uh, Easton's, uh, he has some things written about this and maybe I'll read Easton's and um, other commentaries once we, we understand this concept um, at the end when we're reading a whole bunch of commentaries we can go through and see who understands it and see who doesn't. So um, but we have, it's interesting, the Jehovah's Witnesses have the following, this is on their website. The book of the history Matthew's opening words in Greek, Vivlos Genesios, also could be rendered the historical record of the, or the record of the genealogy. So they get one thing right. It could be like historical record of what was produced from Christ or the record of the genealogy. So it's like, okay, this is a, a genealogical list of Jesus. The Greek word Genesis literally means origin, birth, or line of descent. Okay, so they're getting that same type of um, understanding from Westcott and Hort. Um, it is used in the Septuagint to render the Hebrew term um, Toloteth, which has a similar meaning and is usually rendered history in the book of Genesis. Okay, so we can check all those places. 
and many times it's you know history um but we've also got to be careful these are the jehovah's witnesses talking as well so um the jw um uh, following logic sorry the jw's following earlier logic written in the appendix of their 1969 kingdom interlinear translation it has matthew 1 1 history genesis uh greek um in uh, Toledoth in Hebrew. The evident meaning of the Greek word Genesis here is history. In Matthew 1 1, it occurs in the very same expression as we find the Greek Septuagint ver version of Genesis 2 4 and 5 1, namely Phiblos Genesios. Um, at Genesis 2 4, the expression could not refer to the generations of the heaven and the earth because those in eminent uh, creations could not themselves generate anything and so it's i thought that was an interesting point um so anyway then they go through to talk about the jehovah's witness version so um we have what they've written here so i've, I've typed all that out and um of what they say there so um so we have a few other things the birth of jesus so it has here the position of the name uh 2d at uh i x i guess that's i'm not really sure what that is um at the head of the sentence and the reoccurrence of the word genesis points back to matthew 1 1 genesis not genesis with another new is the true reading and the purpose being to express the general idea of origins Ortus, not the specific idea of generation. So you have quite a few errors and quite a few different concepts coming in with this. Um, it's, it's an interesting study to do. Um, Cruden's Bible Dictionary, um, it has uh, generation used for the history and geneolo genealogy of any man. Um, and so it goes through those same ones that we've looked at. Um, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ and the history of his life, death, and resurrection. So that's interesting. It sort of agrees with what Adam Clark was saying and also Burgon. Um, the New King James Version uh, changed this verse to the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Um, we are all aware that we have the genealogy of Joseph in this chapter. God did not use the Greek word genealogia here which means gene genealogy exactly in 1 Timothy uh, 1, 4 and Titus 3, 9, and where genealogies are condemned, you know, um, getting obsessed with genealogies are condemned. Instead, the Greek word in the Texas Receptus is Genesios. The King James translated the Greek word Genesios, which comes from Genesis, as generation. This is precisely what Strong's exhaustive concordance has at um, 1076, it says Genesis nativity, uh, figuratively, uh, or it's fi figurative, uh, nature, generation, nature, or natural. And that would have been nature, you know, going back to the original GN words, nature. It's interesting. The meaning of Genesis or origin or birth is the sphere of this earthly life so generation is faithful and accurate and subject to further exposition genealogy is a replacement of genesis which is an unauthorized substitution and changes the meaning what matthew is saying is that the gospel is the book of what jesus christ wrought in his birth the entire sphere of his earthly life etc what genealogy, the genealogy of Christ's stepfather is only a portion of that. So, um, okay, so that's sort of, then the next thing I'll go to is of Jesus Christ. But that's one of the main things is the generation there. So um, I've got a little bit about Jesus Christ there. Uh, then I've got John Mills Latin. I don't have a translation for that. And so, um, but yeah, so that gives you a good idea. So this is you know going to be Matthew one one study number one. So because I'm going to end it very soon.
And I think what I might do is I might actually jump over to have a look at this um, debate. And um, yeah, if you if you go to that debate and you want to watch it, just um, put it on um, yeah one point five speed, and it it'll, it'll eventually catch up to to the live um, debate because it's only been going for like you know twenty minutes so far. And you can sort of skip the prefatory material, you know, just go like five minutes in or whatever, ten minutes in, and you'll get closer to that time. So, yeah, just to sort of sum things up, we've gone through um, my website here. And so we've gone through, you know, the text of Beza, King James, my one. We went through a little bit of an introduction into this verse and um, a, a little bit of a commentary uh, about it, what the book means and how it's related to the um, term Biblos, which was, it still is, a port um, it's still occupied in Lebanon. That would be an amazing place to visit. And the etymology of book there and um, in several languages. And then we looked at of the generation and what that means. We looked at Solomon Milan, um, who is this character and what he writes about it um, coming against um, Alfred's um, Genesis there. And so this is pre-Westcott and Hort. But then we see um, Dean Bergon after Westcott and Hort or around that same period of time, he's condemning that. And he's saying, this is ridiculous. Uh, this is, and he clearly says, you know, um, you go through the first line and you're brought to a standstill. You know, it's this first line of the Bible is attacked. So clearly we're in line with what Bergon believed here. So, which is great because it's, when I first got this concept, I was like, I was all over the place with it and tr just trying to figure this out. It's like a puzzle game. And so hopefully this has helped you. So what we're going to go through next time is we're going to look at of Jesus Christ, um, the son of David, uh, the son of Abraham. So we're going to look at those two titles. Um, and then we're going to go through editions of the Texas Receptor. So this will give me a little bit of time too to tidy up some of these things because uh, there are some places where it's like uh, Colonnaeus. I haven't got his text there. I'd love to get it. Sess's text, I'd love to put that in there. We're going to go through any differences, any tiny little jots and tittles. We're going to go through all of these um, and we're going to examine them. And then we're going to look at um, other Greek. So we're going to go through the, uh, a lot of these manuscripts. I've written them down here. What nomina sacra is... Um, where it appears, where it doesn't appear, printed Greek texts. Um, we're going to look at after Lockman, Luckman, and so um, what happened there with the TR editions. And um, we're going to be looking at Mill's text. Then we're going to be going back through the Anglo-Saxon line through to the English translations, and we're going to go through all of them. And um, yeah, obviously that will be exciting because we're going to be going through you know, to the King James, the Geneva Bible, Bishop's Bible, etc., And then we're going to be going through some of the foreign language um, Bibles. And then what we're going to do is we're going to read the commentaries. So we're going to go through all of these commentaries. We're just going to read them all out and we're going to study these. And then um, we will get to the stage where we finish Matthew 1.1. It might take, you know, two or three lessons, but I think hopefully you've watched this and you realize it's not just you know the book of the ge genealogy of jesus christ this is so boring there's actually a war against this verse <laughs> you know just just the, this the words that is it a book is this about the book of matthew is it about it about the whole new testament is it about um just this section or is it this section and christ's life i believe it's this section and christ's life which which would be the whole book of matthew and so um, this is a Hebrew way of writing it. So also, so if if you guys want to help with this study, where I would be going next time is we're going to be going through, you know, this um, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So obviously these have um, their own whole complete entire studies um, with who, you know, David is, who Abraham is, and we could go into all that, but we don't want to, you know, we know who these guys are. We, we want to get a general idea of what it means to for Jesus to have the title because blind people are on the side of the road saying, uh, you know, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, you know. And so every, all the Jews were sons of Abraham, but to be a son of David, you know, that was 
an interesting thing um, to be um, part of that promised lineage. Um, and so if you guys want to help at all, anything that has to do with the Texas Receptus, if you go through my, through my site and you see that the Elzebiz in the 1633, I don't have that written in there. It would be great if someone just goes, here, here, Nick, I looked that up. Here's what it means there. Here it is in the 1641, the 1679. It mightn't have any differences whatsoever, but it's good to fill all this in so that people doing studies later on, they can go through this video, they can go through all this information, and they can say, okay, yes, that matches up with this and that and all the rest of it. And also, we want to go through the footnotes. Like, we can go through the footnotes of the King James. We want to go through um, Beezus 1598. So having a good, faithful translation of Beza. So we have the annotations even of Erasmus. Now, I'm sure there's books out there that talk about Liber Generationis uh, in the Latin. So this section here, I'm sure that someone's translated that somewhere. So it would be great to get that as well. And so I'm going to be going through and trying to search for this stuff myself. Um, and then we've got the son of David, the son of Abraham. So, he, he, you know, this is Erasmus writing on exactly what we want to study. So we want to find out what Erasmus said here. Um, we also want to look at the source material. So we want to, once we hit this part of the... So that, yeah, that's Erasmus, that's Beza. So I want to get both of those um, translated. But then once we hit the Texas Receptus part of the study, um, Complutensian Polyglot, the Aldine, Kephalos, um, Erasmus, we want to make sure that we're looking at all the annotations in every edition. Um, we want to look at his text, but we also want to match up the Latin and make sure that what he's got there is accurate. And um, then we're going through Stephanus. We'll be looking at the editions of Stephanus, say, in his uh, 1550. Does he have any you know, type of marginal notes here that uh, are, are relative to other manuscripts and things like that? Um, and Theodore Beza, we want to go through all of his editions and um, you know, get to the place where we're looking at the 1598. So with what the King James had in front of them, the dodecaglot, um, of Elias Hutter, Plantin Polyglot. How do these differ? Uh, many times they're exactly the same. It might just be a capitalization of Abraham or something like that. But um, yeah, so we've got a lot to go through. But I, I enjoy this type of study. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys can help with that. That'll be really good. If not, I'm just going to continue to go through with what I have. So anyway, um, thanks for joining us, guys. So this is part to the end of part two. So we're still in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. I'm going to be um, studying this all week, and I'm going to go through as much as I can, and we will go through Matthew 1.1 1, 1. Um, again. This will be uh, in the next video will be part three. And, um, yeah, so I might see you guys over at the debate. Uh, so it's already been going for 27 minutes. So I'm going to finish this video now and uh, we'll continue this on um, another day. So I, just to let you guys know, I'd love to do this type of thing. I know, you know, people are, are restrained for time and everything like that, but I would love to do this type of thing like at least, you know, two or three times a week. Um, to do this every day would be a dream. But, um, you know, it just... Yeah, it takes time, takes a lot of effort and all the rest of it. But um, at the moment, I'm just going to commit myself to one a week. So um, this will continue on the same time next week. So I'm, I'm going to go through the Textual Confidence Collective um, uh, video, the final video that they've got. I'm going to go through that this week as well. And after that's over, it'll give me a bit of free time to, <laughs> to um, study this a little bit more and to get into some better things but uh thanks for joining us guys god bless you and have a great weekend